from his autobiography. My name is Bifati Feolufemi Adishoye. I'm the director of the play. Please enjoy the show. I am proud of you. Thank you, sir. You know, with all this, you are supposed to win glory that will amaze everyone. But wait a minute. I will propose to the headmaster, because of the great potential that I have seen in you, that you become the prefect of craft making. Ah, me? You deserve it, my boy. You won't come. Just so I will surely be living with one of these. I don't want to use the expensive baskets in my house. I can't be keeping my onions anyhow. You know? Yes, sir. You know? Then. But let's set that aside. I have come to inform your parents and to also let you know that it's time to study hard because you'll be representing our school. The provincial examination at local Javari School. Ah, ah, sir. Look, 
I thank you for all you have been doing, sir. So may God do for all your efforts. Oh, <laughs> don't worry, my boy. Your success is my pride. You know, you really deserve this. <laughs> Study hard for the coming examination, okay? I will. Oh, my basket. <laughs> and I send my greetings to dad. Don't forget. Okay, Eli. Hey, sir. Bye bye, sir. Give me. Look, Oja. Your success is my pride, boy. Study hard for the coming examination because you're representing our school in the provincial examination at Oja. We will meet you, friends. My children, I want to tell you a story, but before then, we are going to sing a song. When I sing, Aranru, Aranru, you respond by singing, Inomba te, Regunte, Inomba. What did I say? Inomba te, Regunte, Inomba. That's good. Around, around, in about a good day, in about Kilo Ashani, lay you in about a good day, in about Emunimo, Adao, in about a good day, in about Elolemu. That's cool. Now, in those days, inhabitants of the heavens and planet Earth interacted with each other. Yes. As a matter of fact, this folk tale tells a story 
about a mystic palm wine tapper who is not visible to the client. Wow. Yes. He comes, taps, and sells palm wine to the people on planet Earth. Back then, way back then, buying and selling was purely on trust. You can come, keep your wares at the crossroad, come back later, and take your money. Yes, of course, just like that. And that is why we say, Arauru, Arauru. for yourselves. Uh, my cousin from Adosa. What did this work? Looking for an employment. He was a teacher at Emmanuel School. All right, call him in. That's good, my children. You can go now. Bye. With mommy and daddy for me. Good afternoon, sir. How are you, young man? Ah, I'm fine, thank you, sir. Will you like to be a teacher here? Ah, <laughs> yes, sir. I've been looking for a job for a long time, sir. And you have found yourself a job. Eh? I said, you have found yourself <laughs> hey! Ah! Oh, 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 oh! Ah, thank you so much. Ah, hey, sir. Hey, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Hey! Yeah. Oh, my. Thank thank you. <laughs> I have found this young man and discovered that he is a bomb. Wait. HOD Performing Arts. That was the play. An excerpt from the autobiography of the great man, Are Afe Babalola. That's just a small slice. Uh, the real big loaf will be coming, and I know you want to watch it. Thank you very much for joining our show.
So let's watch out now for part two. You would be reading or seeing 11 quotes, 11 memorable quotes from Are Babalola this morning. Full happiness can only be achieved when one makes others happy. Time is life. Life is time. Time does not wait for anyone. Lost time is irretrievable. <laughs> It is not an offense under our laws to remain idle, but it is a sin to, to be indolent. The establishment of Abad is an act of God, predicated on faith that is achievable. Faith breeds determination, determination breeds success, and faith never fails. Ideas rule the world, but only those who translate ideas into reality make the difference. Your most reliable friend and companion are your two hands. <laughs> response to a fool is complete silence. Do not leave till tomorrow the work fixed for today. determines the appropriate type of welcome you will receive. When you already know that a person is lying to you, neither side is deceived. And so, you have seen, heard, and you can also read some of our celebrant's most memorable quotes. As you put your hands together, it pleases me therefore to invite R. F. Babalola to step forward and, and he wants Chief Olusegu Obasanjo to accompany him as they take a photograph
bearers may now return to their base. Thank you very much. I think this is done. Thank you very much. That applause is not strong enough for 11 powerful quotes. For anyone who has read the history, the biography of our celebrant, you may agree that a word that best describes his ascension to all of this success is the word adversity. And talking about quotes, let me share with us one quote on adversity. I don't know its author, the name is Patrick Henry, but it says, adversity toughens manhood. And the characteristic of the good or great man is not that he has been exempt from the evils of life, but that he has surmounted them. Ladies and gentlemen, beyond overcoming adversity and excelling, there is more to this man of the moment. His story, therefore, may be better told by men and institutions who know him better and differently. On that note, it pleases me, therefore, to now invite a few respected revered gentlemen who know our celebrant better and maybe from a perspective not known to all of us. Certainly, one such man is a man who is seated right next to him. Ladies and gentlemen, for another hefty applause of the day, please help me make welcome former president, former head of state, Africa's most distinguished statesman, the one and only Baba of the world, Chief Olusegun Matthew Obasanjo, GCFR. I don't know what you are clapping for. <clears throat> but whatever it is, let us clap together for the, for the celebrant of today. Let me thank God for this day. God himself has chosen to celebrate an icon. And when you have an icon as a friend, as I do have, you get orders and you obey orders. Aria Feba Balala called me and said, there will be the celebration of my 60th year at the bar. And you have to be there. I said, yes, sir. And you have a role to play. I say, yes, sir. I was expecting to hear what the role is. 
And I won't tell you what the role is. I say yes, sir. Then I travel. And my travel turned out to be on the day, which is today, that the celebration should be taking place. I should be in Edinburgh, in Scotland. When I have, have obeyed the order of my friend, my brother, my confidant, my icon, then what do I do? I went to Scotland, of course. And when they said to me, we will be having the closing session of our conference this morning, I said, no, I have order to, be, to obey. And I have to leave yesterday morning. Not knowing that I will be called upon to make a statement, I wrote a tribute. And I said a little bit of what I thought I know about Araya Febabalala. But the play we have seen this morning, which actually let us into the secret or part of the secret of his success was very illuminating and very enlightening. And sitting by his side, I was commenting. I like where he was studying and he had to put water in a bucket and put his feet on the, in the water so that he may not sleep. And I said, Are, I did that, but my feet, when I slept, pour the water and the calabash out and everything spill on the floor. So putting feet water did not help me much. Did it help you? I think it helped Araya Febabalala. That's part of why he is what he is today. I believe the lesson from that is also captured in some of unforgettable saying, hard work leads to success. You can choose to be lady, lazy. There's no law against that. But if you are indolent, it is a sin. And of course, Unless you seek for forgiveness, anything is punishable by God, not even by earthly government. I have come to know and learn a lot 
for Mare Asabala. It's a man you must never take for granted. If you do, you are on your own. That I will say to you. He's a serious minded man. And if you don't know that, you don't know anything. If he's laughing with you, and it's humorous, a little bit. But when you hit him on the wrong side, you will see the other side of his eyes, as I saw this morning, because I came late. And immediately said to me, where have you been? I said, All right. I was in a little bit early, but I recall Bishop called, which one will you answer? If you don't answer the bishop, he may report you to God. If you refuse to answer Are, then uh, you are on your own. So I came early enough, and I even sent a message that Bishop Cooker is expecting me for breakfast. And I thought that I do not go to Bishop Cooker for breakfast. Not only will his breakfast be wasted, he may report me to God. Of course, Bishop Puka I know very well. I've always told him that I will enter the kingdom of God before him. <laughs> and he has also always told me that it's the cause of people like me that he has become a bishop so that you can enter the kingdom of God together. As my brothers and sisters in uh, Cross River and Nakwabomi we say sixty years is no yoke. Sixty years is no yoke. And are Babalala. I join everybody, members of your family, friends, and colleagues, and well wishers to congratulate you on this very important mileage in your career and in your life. Those who have worked with you, whether as colleagues, as clients, and in what other areas we have worked with you, we know your work. And for me, I, I could not have had a lawyer to handle my intricate cases as you handled them for me. On this occasion, again, I thank you for a job well done. When after an election and elections, I have to be taken to court to prove that the decision of the electoral umpire was a fair and right decision. That's not all. When 
when this one sir this is the one yes this is the one when all right as president of this country i gave you the task of managing the affairs as the chairman of council of Lagos University. You perform so eminently that you became the best chairman of council, pro chancellor in Nigeria. I cannot forget that. I cannot forget that. And I know that any task, any assignment, any responsibility that you are given and you accept to do it, whoever gives you that assignment, you go and see it. Because you will do it to the best of your ability. And if you do not achieve success in it, even the man who gave you or the person who gave you the job or the assignment, if he does it, he will fail more than you have failed. That's what I know about you. That's what I cherish about you. And that's what endears you. page 23 of the uh, bulletin. My tribute is printed. And um, Those areas where we have interacted, I mentioned them in my tribute. But the greatest lesson that I have learned from you is that there's no rest for as long as you have the grace of God and you breathe the free air of God. Because I would have thought that after your many years in the bar, or at the bar, in the bar, that would be in prison, isn't it? You didn't go to prison, I went. So it is at the bar in your case. It will be in the bar in my case. But I would have expected you, I would have expected you to be resting, to be relaxing. But then that was the time you decided to take on the onerous responsibility and duty of establishing this university. And you take it right from the beginning. And within a short period of time, you make it the leading university in the country. That is a lesson that we should all learn. Whatever we are given to do and whatever we agree to do or whatever we make, our, make up our mind to do, we should put the best of ourselves into it and make it the best that
that they can be. You have made this university the best that any university can be in Nigeria. I appreciate that. Well, my dear senior brother, my dear friends, my dear confidants, What remains what remains is more of what you have done. You have met this world at a point. You have met your community at a point. You have met your family at a point. And what you have done is you have, what you have met, you have made it better than what you have found. So your journey or your life is a journey. It's not a destination. And the foundation, the edifices that we are putting on the ground will continue to be built up upon even when after many, many more years on the surface of the earth, you have, you have to go back to your, to your creator. So that those things that you have put your hands on and you have said your two hands are your best friend. Your two hands are the things that can make you and make the environment that you are in. You have proved that. My prayer is that even when you depart this world, what you have left behind will continue to speak eloquently about what you have used your two hands to achieve. Congratulations. <laughs> speaks the world listens and as his excellency former president Olusegun Obasanjo acknowledges the guests on the front row let us give him another round of applause in doing so let me quickly let the house know that indeed there's a gentleman who's been in this hall. Please, we may be seated. Thank you. There's a gentleman who's been in this hall and is accompanied Chief Olushengo Basanjo to his seat. It pleases me to let the House know that the gentleman in question served as the head of the civil service of this great nation under Chief Olushengo Obasanjo. The same gentleman subsequently became Minister of Defense of this same Federal Republic of Nigeria. And in the year 2008, the man I speak of was appointed Secretary to the Government of the Federation by former President Mar Yaradwa. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Alhaji Yayale Ahmed.
We will hear from Al Haji Yayali Ahmed later on today because he's one of the panelists to feature before us when the keynote address is delivered today. Also with us and seated next to Al Haji Yayali Ahmed is former governor of Ekiti State, His Excellency Mr. Shegun Oni. I think he stepped out momentarily. When he comes back, we shall let him know that he has been introduced. And lastly, for this segment, the Emir of Iloring, Al Haji Dr. Ibrahim Zulu Gambari, is not here, but he has sent a worthy representative in the person of Dr. Usman Abubakar Jos, Balugun Alanomu of Iloring. We want to welcome you for being a worthy representative of Al Haji Dr. Ibrahim Sulu Gambari, the Emir of Iloring. We have one or two more introductions to quickly make before we continue with the program. Your Excellencies, we have in Amis to celebrate with us this day His Imperial Majesty, Oba Dr. Victor Adesimbo Kiladejo, the CFRD Oshimawe of Ondo. You are welcome, sir. We have in the house the Olojudo of Idoikiti, Oba Ilori Faboro. Kabisi, you are welcome. Equally, we have in the house His Royal Majesty Oba Ulu Polani Ogunso Alara of Lara Ekwe. Kabisi, you are welcome, sir. His brother Obade She Obade Shagun Bolaji Alowole the Elemuren of Emuren Ogun State. You are heartily welcome. There's a gentleman in the house who is well known to virtually everybody here, former executive secretary of Tet Fund, a very good friend of Abuad, an alumnus of Abuad, Professor Elias Bogoro. You are welcome, sir. I often find it difficult to introduce this gentleman. He has so many things in common with the man we are celebrating today. I'm talking about Mr. Femi Falano, SAN. There was a time in the 60s when the man we are celebrating today was described by the judge in the old Western region as lawyer Kiigo Kiigba. I think Femi Falano shares that with Arafi Bala. You are welcome, sir. We have in the house a rep the representative of the AUC, Dr. Abiyadun Saliw. We appreciate you, sir. Of course, our own friend and brother, Justice Akintayo Alukwa, his wife. We appreciate you. I, will, I should let you know that we have uh, representatives of banks in the house. We have with us the MD of Wema Bank. We appreciate you. That of Union Bank is equally here. We treasure you. First Bank MD, we appreciate you. The founder of Elizabeth University is here with us, Abit, in a representative capacity. He is here represented by the registrar, Mr. Adegbe Nro. We have in our midst distinguished ladies and gentlemen, his Excellency the Governor of Ocean State, Mr. Jackson Nurudin Ademola Adeliki, represented by, <laughs> represented by Mr. Kyle de Titiloe. You are welcome. Equally, we have the representative of the Inspector General of Police, in person of the Commissioner of Police, Security State Command, Mr. Emmanuel Ogundari. You are welcome, sir. Of course, I must not forget to let you know that the MBA executives of Adoe Kitty, led by their chairman, L.A. Fasomi Esquire, is here. We appreciate you. Honorable Justice Yabo Yerima, the Chief Judge of Oyo State, represented by Justice La Diro Akintola of the Oyo State High Court. We appreciate you. Thank you. Brother Harry. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the next person to address us on the little he knows about the man we are celebrating today is the executive governor of Ekiti State, a man who has endeared himself to the people of the state in the short term of his
being at the steering wheel of the activities of Ekiti State. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the Governor of Ekiti State, Mr. Abiodun Abayomi, to the podium. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellency, the former President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Chief Olusegun Obasanjo, GCFR, the celebrant, the founder and the founder of Abuad, the living spirits behind the creation of equity states, God's gift, God gifts to mankind and a special gift to equity states, the father of the governor of equity states. Are Afa Babalola and Mami Yeyare Afe Babalola and members of the immediate family and friends of Daddy. The representative of the CGN, my lord, the CG of Equity States, and other judges of the judiciary that are here, both serving and retire, and uh, the president, customary court of appeal, Equity States. Let me use Chief Emeka and Yaoku as a point of contact to all the distinguished Nigerians that are here today. I can't mention everybody's name. Distinguished members of the bar that are here in their numbers. KBC Arule Odua, Ojoja II, Imperial Majesty, Obadeye Eni Tungusi. KBC, I salute you, sir. I use the chair of the State Council of Traditional Rulers, KBC Onishan, as a point of contact to all royal fathers that are here, but I must specially recognize our chief host, the Ewe of Ado Ekiti. <clears throat> our distinguished leader, former governor of Ekiti State, Chief Shegoni, nice to see you, sir. Our Lord Spiritual, the Bishop of the Anglican Communion and Bishop of the Catholic Church, you are recognized, Captain of Industry, the Chair of the Governing Council, the Vice Chancellor, faculty members, management and staff of Abuad. Good morning. Well, um, I'm not going to read my speech. It's easier for me to speak about Daddy from my heart. Daddy, I congratulate you. Thank you so much for what you are to humanity. Thank you so much for providing platform for those that are hopeless to have hope. Thank you, Daddy, because I can stand there today as a governor of Ekiti State because of people like you. <clears throat> Whenever I'm called to speak about Daddy, what comes to my mind is what you like to say about him. And I'm going to share my own life experience. And this is not, I'm not making it up. Thank God. But it's a big guy, SAN is here in this audience. It's, it's a living witness. I went to UI to do my master's. And I was, I had a room in the university. But because I saved some money while I was serving, to do my master's so to relieve my parents from the burden of sponsoring me and creating a space for them to take care of, of my siblings. That money w wasn't enough to prosecute my, MS my MSc program. So weekend I go to Boyega's house 
So I will, I will, I will spend Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday with Boyega just to reduce costs and come back to the university. Boyega was doing his MSc at IFE. But I didn't know that they will ask us to be, to be type, type setting uh, assignments. I thought you don't run by long answer you submit. But lo and behold, they said we have to be typing every assignment. And I told Boyega, I can't afford this. He said, just bring me the manuscript. So I will give Boyega the manuscript. He will take it to Emmanuel Chambers. Daddy used to have one secretary. They call him Siaka and Oburi F1. I don't know if I'm right. Yeah, yeah. Boyega will take the manuscript there. They will type and bring to me. I will submit. So one day I asked him that if this man got to know that we are using his, his, his papers, his time to do this thing, he said, no. If Baba is aware of this, Baba will be very happy. So I did my master's degree. So since we are doing it free of charge, I packed my project, I dumped there. And they did the project for me, you know. And I got my MSc. I never met chief, but I used to go to the chamber. I used the library to read. And after, the, after the, my second degree, I, I picked up a lecturing a job at the university here. Then the struggle for the creation of the Kiddie State started. I joined the committee as a member. Later, I became the secretary of that committee. I was the youngest. And I was shocked at daddy's level of humility and commitment to that cause. And one picture that always runs through my mind is the fact that the day we are going to Mbane for Pana in Akure to defend uh, a request for state creation. A night before the presentation, Daddy drove him from Ibadan. We were in Kabi Kabi is a Palace. So I was one of the people that had the privilege and honor to go to his vehicles to pack the loads of books and everything, following him to a Wiz Palace. And Daddy insisted that we are going to Akure tomorrow, but can we do a mock presentation? And I was asking myself, this man is an SAN, we are not learned, what do we know? He insisted that we, we just have to do a mock presentation. And he took comments from everybody. When we got to Akure the following day, Daddy's performance was, was unforgettable. And Daddy, that singular act of patriotism and commitment to your people gave us a Kitty State. If we don't have this state, Daddy, hi, I repeat, hi, and all others that have gone of this state, we don't, we don't have a platform to stand on. And on behalf of those that have governed this state, that provided the platform for. And those that will come after us, I say thank you. God bless you. It doesn't take too much to identify anyone who would be very successful at their task. Clearly, listening to the governor of Ekiti State, I can say that if you are from Ekiti State, you must feel very blessed to have the governor that you have today. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Let's just say that you have put yourself in the spotlight and all of the world will be looking forward to the transformational steps you bring upon to bear in this great state in our country. Ladies and gentlemen, talking about great people, sometimes educationists never get the quantum of appreciation that they deserve. It is on that note that at this point, I would like to single out for very special appreciation a woman who is a member of the governing council of the Association of All African Universities. This woman, who is very, very tireless, is 40 years at the bar. And believe it or not, 
called to the bar in 1983. She was called to the bar on the 8th of July. Remember that Are Afe Babalola was called to the bar on the 9th of July. So maybe that played a role in her being recruited as the vice chancellor of the <laughs> Afe Babalola University at Just to add that the lady in question has taught many SANs here today with us. Of course, we expect that after 40 years at the bar as a teacher of law. I speak of no lesser personality than the vice chancellor of this great university, Professor Smaranda Olarinde. <laughs> vice chancellor, it looks like only the people on this side of the hall saw you. If I ask you to do a little catwalk and you walk to where Baba Obasanjo is and come back, give me the heraldry song again, the band. <laughs> Fantastic. I had to ask her, I said, dear madam, where exactly are you from? And she told me, it's a combination of Romania and Hungary. Now, the interesting thing about those countries, if you've ever gone there, is you can't even read the sentences. You have C, Z, S, all kinds of things combined. <laughs> so it's uh, instructive that you're able to come to Nigeria, immerse yourself into our culture, and be such a worthy representation of all that Nigeria has to offer. We congratulate you and welcome you. And as part of the work that this tireless woman does, she has brought together here a very large delegation from some of the international universities that are affiliates of this great university here. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us the Vice Chancellor of the Durban University of Technology all the way from South Africa here with us. And we also have with us the University of London, representatives from the University of London and King's College, United Kingdom, all represented here. The delegation is a seven-man strong delegation that has come all the way to join us in celebrating your doyen and the founder of your great university. I'd like to ask all of these representatives to stand wherever you may be. Please stand. Let's, fantastic. We want to welcome you to Aduikiti, and we hope that now that you're here, you're not going back. <laughs> Please, you may be seated. Thank you very much. And so having dispensed with that, let me very quickly, therefore, invite Dr. Fumi Olunishaking, who is the representative of King's College London and the University of London, to come and tell us about her experience with our celebrant. Please give her a round of applause as she comes. Thank you so, so much. I'm testing my voice. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I love feedback from students especially. <laughs> Baba Are Afe Babalola. Yeye Modupe Babalola. Baba, as we call him also, President Olushe Gumabasanjo. It's wonderful to see you again, Baba. Excellencies, especially Excellency, the governor of my state. Other excellencies, distinguished guests and colleagues, all protocols observed. Let me first say how delighted I am to be here today as a Nigerian and as an indigenous of Ikiti State here. <laughs> of course, as a representative of King's College London, and I'm also standing in for the Vice Chancellor uh, of the University of London. But King's College London is now home 
to the Afe Babalola Center for Transi Transitional, uh, Transnational Education. I'll say more about this later. Now, I'm especially proud to be leading a six-member delegation from King's College London for this celebration. There are three Nigerians in the group, I'll have you know, uh, here, right? Including myself uh, as Vice President for International Engagement and Service, uh, my colleague, Professor Abiodo Alao, Professor of African Studies, my colleague, Associate Professor Ekaite Ipe, and that's a reader in development economics in Africa. These are the three leading Africans at King's College London. But we are, I'm also proud to say that we, I have a heavyweight team here just to celebrate this day with you, Baba. We have renowned Professor Jenny Gallagher, MBE, Ambassador International Engagement and Service, and Newland Pedri, uh, Professor of Dentistry. Now, we have Sarah Cook, who's a historian by training, an associate director with us at King's, and a member of my team in the international office, Lucas Palumbo, who's an alumnus of King's College London. I wanted to mention them by name so that you know that we took our time, Baba, to come here to celebrate uh, this day with you. Now, let me say, though, that for se several decades, the opportunity to meet and know Baba eluded me. And like most Nigerians of my generation, I knew him only by reputation as one of Nigeria's finest lawyers, as has already been said. However, the intensity of our closeness since I came to know him has made up for, in affection, uh, what it lacks in the number of years. Of course, I, you know, Baba Obasanjo is a close friend of his, and they've been together all these years. And I'm just realizing from Professor, from uh, Baba Obasanjo that he considers you a senior brother and confidant. I'm not surprised uh, at all. Now, I, I need to say this in terms of my observations. We're told to talk about the Are Afe Babalola that we know. And let me say that his grace, his charm, his quick wittedness, and the audacity of his boldness all make him one of the most remarkable people I have ever met. And if I may adapt the Shakespearean adage, I'm adapting it. He was, he was not born great, we saw from the play, but he achieved greatness. And he has had greatness thrusted upon many, many others. So where do I really start talking about array in that sense? This will be brief, but there are three parts to what I want to say in my brief message to you this morning. The first is a short personal reflection and observation. The second is a message from King's College London, where I'm vice president, as I said earlier, including a goodwill message from my president uh, at King's College London, Professor Shitit Kapoor. And the third is a message from the Vice Chancellor of the University of London, Professor Wendy Thompson, who couldn't make it here, but she asked me to convey this message. Now, for the benefit of those who may not know, King's College London, which it is a university in its own right, I should say, but it is also uh, a founding member of the University of London. Two, university found, two universities founded King, uh, University of London in 1836. That's King's College London and University College London at the time. Let me now offer the first, which is my personal brief reflections uh, on Are Afe Babalola that I know. In a way, I think I can best describe him using a string of paradoxical epithets. He's generous but frugal. He is firm but fair. He is frank but sympathetic. He is radical but strategic. He is compassionate but blunt. He is considerate but constructively critical. He is, he is open but tactically cautious. He is boisterously friendly, and many of you have seen that. I've seen that in this uh, short period of time, but not gregarious. He has the right dosages of everything that is needed for a successful and meaningful life, 
and his immense personal strength, selflessness, and unwavering faith have brought us the realization of personal ambitions to thousands of people who have been privileged to encounter him. And I think people in this audience will acknowledge that, uh, that fact. There is, however, uh, an aspect of Arez's attributes that is often uh, concealed behind the seriousness of his utterances. And that is his sense of humor. Baba Obasanjo talked about it a short while ago. Indeed, Arefe Babalola is a word smith, and you saw that in the quotable quotes. He knows how to leave his audience with at least one phrase they would always have to remember him by. You saw that uh, just now, and you'll see that, you've seen that already in the booklet. Now, let me bring a King's College London uh, perspective to this message uh, this morning. I can speak of a rare affair with multiple springs to his steps, his intellectual steps, and you have seen that as an impact multiplier who builds bridged, bridges between generations and between the world of today and that of tomorrow, far into the future. At King's College London, we believe in the power of education and its role in service society. To, in service to society. This is a belief shared with Arefe Babalola, who for many years has been tireless in his efforts to break down the barriers for young Africans and to increase access to high quality education. Thanks to Baba, we can proudly say today that many young African people in Africa and for generations to come will have access to opportunities that otherwise would not have been available to them. All right? And his transformative donation has helped us create the Afe Babalola Center for Transnational Education at King's College London. This center, this center will do three things, amongst many others. One, it will offer life-changing education, blended and online programs to help talented young Africans con contribute to their communities and the world. Two, it will provide a valuable opportunity to strengthen and grow our work with leading university partners in Africa. Our board is going to be one of them already is one of them, to deliver bespoke transformative education. Third and last, fund, it will fund student scholarships to encourage more young people to seek a rewarding education. In the decades ahead, hundreds of thousands of Africans that will pass through this center will have one Babalola to thank, and that is Eni Afe Babalola. The president of King's College London, Professor Shitich Kapoor, who will be visiting abroad in a few weeks' time, conveys his heart, heartfelt thanks to Arefe for his generosity towards generations of students to come and congratulates you, uh, Baba, on the occasion of this 60th anniversary since being called to bar. This outstanding achievement is testament to Arefe's dedication to excellence and service. And his story is a powerful example of the life-changing opportunities that are afforded by higher education. I will show this. You may not see it, but if the screen picks it up, you will see that we have, we have already at King's put something here, created for Baba for this special occasion itself. And that's about the Transnational Education Center. And it's not by accident that I'm wearing the King's College London red today to celebrate uh, your occasion. Now, let me close with a brief message from Professor Wendy Thompson, Vice Chancellor of University of London. And I quote, on behalf of everyone at the University of London, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate Are Afe Babalola on the 60th anniversary of being called to bar. We're very proud. In fact, let me, let me uh, skip. I skipped something already. Are, your journey is remarkable and an inspirational example of everything we strive to do as a university to educate, to empower, and to give back. We're very proud of your standing as a treble alumnus of the University of London. For those who don't know, 
He has a BSc in Economics from University of London at the LSE. He has an LLB in Law from University of London. And this, the treble alumnus she's referring to includes the honorary degree we were pleased to bestow on you in 2015 in recognition of a career and life dedicated to providing opportunities to others. I carry on on her behalf. This includes, of course, your dedication within Nigeria. By establishing a board in 2009, you have harnessed education to counter the effects of ignorance, disease, and poverty. Some of this is from you as well, uh, Baba, from some of your quotes. There is clear alignment between the mission of the University of London, which, as you know, was itself the catalyst for education in Nigeria. Your own personal contribution to both the University of London in directly supporting our students and your outstanding support of King's College London in establishing the Afe Babalola African Center for Transnational Education is a testament to your inspiration as a leader. Baba, I want to say that on behalf of all of us, we congratulate you and we're proud to be a part of your history. But Wendy Thompson, on behalf of the University of London, sent you this portrait, which you will probably remember. I think it's one of you receiving your honorary doctorate from the University of London. I thank you. Okay, so as expected, Dr. Fumi Oloni Shaking will step forward now to Baba and present him with the plaque or gift she's brought with her all the way from London. Please, photographers, don't overcrowd it. Can the Vice Chancellor please join in that picture? Please, Madam. Why, why are we not backing this backdrop here? Sorry, please, photographers, celebrant, why are we not using the backdrop so we can tell this properly? If we don't mind, can I ask you to come this way? Do we mind? Is it okay? Okay. Okay, so at this point, let me invite our rep, the head of the research coordinator from the Durban University of Technology, South Africa, Dr. M.M. Awana, to step forward and come and tell us, give us her own perspective. kindly fall under the protocol that has been set previously by my predecessor and by the various speakers. I just want to say a heartfelt um, welcome from the Durban University of Technology situated in the city of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. I'm bringing um, greetings from our Vice-Chancellor, 
Professor Ntembu from the DVCs, especially that of research, and also from the deans of faculties and the whole management and students and staff of the Durban University of Technology. This is my second time being here. I was here last year and I had a rousing re -wel welcome from Abuad. I'm very happy that we are able to be represented again this year on this auspicious occasion. When my vice chancellor heard about it, he said, no, we must send a representative. And fortunately, I was in line to, be, to, to come, and I'm very happy that I'm able to represent our university. The Durban University of Technology has an MOU here with um, Abwat, and it has been one of the most successful MOUs that we have had, and I'm very happy that um, Professor Larin there also of Abwat has mentioned on several locations that it is also one of the most successful MOUs that um, Abwad has also had. So our two universities came together in 2021 under an MOU with this all-encompassing, but we started with PG studies in which we have 30 Abwad um, students, both academic staff and um, non-academic staff, who are undertaking postgraduate studies with us, PhDs, and uh, masters. And we are looking forward for them to graduate very soon because they are all very studious and they're doing very well and progressing in the area of study. And we are also through this MOU looking forward in the long term whereby the two African universities can come together and have joint degrees. So a student will have a degree with uh, DUT and upward. This will be our long-term goal. <laughs> Coming to today's occasion, I want to say that this MOU would not have been possible but for the leadership of the founder of this prestige institution, President, we, this is what my Vice Chancellor wrote, President Are Afe Balalola. When I told him that we call him Are Afe Balalola, he said, no, there must be president uh, beside it. So <laughs> I'm very happy to use that um, nomenclature that he has given you, sir. Dear President Are Afe Balalola, that is how he has um, wrote in this letter that I'm going to read to you. He says, congratulations from the Durban University of Technology on your 60th anniversary call to the Bar of England and Wales. On behalf of the executive management and the larger DUT community, I extend our heartfelt congratulations to you and your family on the 60th anniversary of your call to the Bar of England and Wales. This is an impressive milestone, depicting your tireless dedication to the call of justice in Nigeria and also in the African continent. Your wisdom and experience are a true asset to the legal profession. You have been a pillar of strength and wisdom to the Nigerian people and also to Africa, especially when you and your generation, including Dr. Uh, our former president, Lucia Gunobasenjo, fought tirelessly to dismantle the apartheid regime in South Africa. South Africa remembers Nigeria for this, and you are a pillar and a beacon for that to have happened in South Africa. Your contribution and investment in the field of medicine, agriculture, science and technology, law and sports, as well as youth entrepreneurship is laudable. And we pray that this legacy will continue because if there's one thing that Africa needs, we need people like you to lead the youth in entrepreneurship so that youth of Africa can combat poverty through entrepreneurial endeavors. In 2021, the Afia Balalola University entered an MOU with DUT as two sister African countries, and this is something that is very rare. Most African universities look to the north to engage with, but these two universities have decided to engage with one another, and so far it has been a tremendous success. We are very happy to report that this collaboration has become very fruitful and positive in all areas. We have together built each other in terms of capacity, 
We have supervisors from the Durban University of Technology and also from Abwad collaborating together to see the students through. We have had um, exchange programs and we, COVID came and disrupted, but now we are going to resume whereby Abwad students can come over to DUT and vice versa. This would not have been possible without your able leadership. We thank you, sir, for allowing this collaboration between two African universities to take place, even in your lifetime and also in our lifetime. We note as well that Abwad is now ranked the best university in Nigeria, and that is something of great joy to us because we in DUT also, we are ranked number one university of technology in the whole of Southern Africa. We hope that your success will continue to serve as a beacon of hope for future generation. It is an honor to have you as a friend of DUT. We wish you all the best as you celebrate the 60th anniversary of your call to the Bar of England and Wales. We wish you all the best into the future. Thank you so very much. And on behalf of the management and staff of DUT, we present this as a memorial to this great occasion. Thank you very much. Okay, so another presentation to follow from the Durban University of Technology. Please, as we did before, all who joined in the first photograph Please join in this second presentation. There is always something that happens when you know of a person from a distance. You read about them, you see their images, but it's usually something totally different when you get to meet them in person. That exactly was the feeling I got this morning at about 8 a.m. when I came into physical contact with our celebrant of today. Ladies and gentlemen, I dare say to all of us that our celebrant is a man who's got an eye for detail leaves nothing to chance and probably would not trust many people other than himself because he's a man that pursues excellence without let. Beyond all of that, it would not surprise me, it didn't surprise me to see that one of our celebrants' memorable quotes had to do with proper dressing. For I had the privilege of saying to him this morning that just looking at him, not many people would be bold enough to turn out in this very sartorially elegant combination of white and blue with matching shades. That is indeed the look of a capo in person. I want to therefore ask our celebrant to rise to his feet just for one moment. I want us to appreciate how the white waistcoat blends seamlessly with the white bowler hat. You see what I mean. That is a walk of a man of style. Just in case you were in doubt, this is the man we're celebrating today. Like my friends will say in Pigeon, 
then say, snake, not a born shot thing. And as it is with Baba, so it is with the beautiful children that he has brought onto this earth. I speak of perhaps Boyega Babalola, Ayodeji Babalola, and Babalola Vernet, Bolanle Austin Peters, Omomi and Kofu Majakodumi, Tunde Babalola, and of course, Folashade and Deji Ali. These are Baba's children, and I'd like all of us to put our hands together and congratulate all of them, because indeed, all the children embody all of the virtues of this great man of the moment. And to tell us a little bit more from a filial position is none other than the scion of this family, Folashade Ali. Please step forward now and tell us your story. everyone. Good afternoon. So first of all, I'd like to start by thanking the Royal Highness, His Excellencies, the Lord, my, my Lord Justice is here present, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great honor to be here to welcome all of you to celebrate a significant milestone in the life of Are Afebabalala, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, CON. Is a great man and is the man we're celebrating this afternoon. It is an honor and a privilege on behalf of all my siblings who are named once again from Tunde Babalola to Maomi Majakudumi, Balanle Austin Peters, Biodun Bennett, Boyega Babalola, Okpayemi Babalola, Ayodeji Babalola, and Laoye. We'd like to talk about our father, Are Afe Babalola. I'm quite sure most of you don't know much about this aspect of him as being a beloved father. To a lot of people, daddy means a lot because he obviously has wears so many hats and he's touched so many people. But to us, daddy is simply daddy. You know, throughout our lives, you have been such a, a tower of strength, daddy. You are a hero, you are a role model, you are a counselor, a pathfinder. You've taught us all that we know today. And you've always believed in one thing, the power of education. Albert Einstein said, education is, the learning, is not just the learning of facts and figures, but it is the training of the mind to think. Daddy, you sent us all to the best schools in the world. You would do anything for any one of us to achieve that goal, which you really wanted us to be, which is the best. And we want to seize this opportunity to thank you for, for doing that, for every one of us, for sending us to the best schools. And this has given each and every one of us the opportunity for us to be who we are today. We have all created a niche and carved out the best so that we can give back to society in our own ways. And we thank you. You've taught us more than anything the virtues of hard work, of being, of being humble, which I believe all of us are because of you. You're a humble man. You You've given us more than anything, you taught us how to respect others. Money doesn't mean anything to any one of us. You've, give, you've taught us to be selfless and to be loving. Daddy, more than anything, what you've taught each and every one of us is to be independent and not to be dependent on anyone. And all of us are independent, despite the fact that you're a billionaire. The book of Proverbs in chapters 22, 29, because we all believe in God. God has been kind to Daddy. He says, See thou a man diligent in himself. He will walk before kings and not mere men. And daddy, that's truly who you are. You know, if you look at yourself, kings 
presidents all want to dine with you, and they are dining with you. We have our, our, the, our father here, the uh, General Lulisha Ambassador. Everyone wants to be with you, but why? Because you, you worked hard to be where you are. You know, you've demonstrated that anyone can be anything if you put in hard work. Anything that he touches is gold. You're a testament of everything he's done in life. From law, to farming, to education, to hospital, just name it, to his entrepreneurial ventures. Look at the industrial park. Everything that he has touched has been gold. You are phenomenal. You are the best. I don't know anyone on earth. 99.9% .9 in this world cannot do what Daddy has done. I mean, <laughs> Daddy, you taught us to care. You care for us. And Daddy really loves every of his children. But one thing Daddy will not condone is he's a very disciplined man. So he expected high grace from each and every one of us. And he set the bar eye for us. So for all, some of us, I mean, Daddy that we celebrate today, honestly, he believes, he doesn't believe in mediocrity. So if you don't do what you're not, he, he won't just support you. So, so for some people, it looks like, oh, Daddy shows partiality towards some of his children has done well. But that's not true. Daddy just believes that if he can do it, from starting from nowhere, not going to school when he was young, if he could achieve what he did, then why can't we all achieve and put in our best? Because he believes that success is earned through dedication, through perseverance, and shouldn't be bestowed on anyone. Daddy, you're a simple man. You're humble. You know, um, he doesn't believe in social life. He doesn't go out to any social functions. But guess what? We all see the benefit of his hard work today. Um, you can't invite Daddy to any function and he's there. But truly, we're proud of who you are, Daddy. He has, he's like a clock. You know, he has a set time for everything. He wakes up before 7, he's at work before 8 a.m. every day. By 3 p.m., he's back at home to eat, if you know him. By 4, he's gone to sleep. It's siesta time. Daddy wakes up at 8, and guess what? He work, works till midnight. At 92, he's still doing that. He's a strong man. But you know what? Daddy is fashionable. As you can see, we all are fashionable. We took it from my dad. Um, he loves singing. And that's why you see today when he's dancing, Sonia Day is a favorite artist. Because Daddy actually was part of a band when he was young. He's got the most beautiful and amazing voice. But Daddy is also very, very accommodating. Since we were young, you can't come to, to our house to eat at lunch. You think we're having Christmas party. It's always a feast. And I thank Yeye for always preparing those food for each and every one of us. If you had been to our house yesterday, you would think they had planned to have a party. There's nobody that comes to Daddy and he doesn't hand over an envelope to He's such a generous man. I don't know how he does it. He never thinks about himself. He never does anything for himself but work. And, but more than anything, when we were young, my greatest recollection is Daddy wanted us to be as knowledgeable as he is because he's extremely knowledgeable. There's no area, there's no subject that Daddy doesn't know. So he tells us, take a newspaper, read, he will give us um, the Times magazine. Then when he comes back, he's asking you questions about geography, history, which I really hated. But you know, he, that's Daddy, because he just wanted us to excel. And one thing that is remarkable about Daddy is extremely unique. You know, when he says, he really is someone that God's love. He's the apple of God's eye. Five of us are lawyers. Five of us were born on the 21st of, uh, of uh, various months. April, I was born in April 21, my brother June 20, just so many. 21 is daddy's lucky number. So I remember when we were young, his car always had AP 21, 21, AD 21, 21. So I know that anything daddy does that's on the 21st is a success. But lastly, more than anything, daddy, we really love you. You know, um, I think it was Dr. Fumi earlier on that quoted with them Shakespeare that said, some people were born great, some achieve greatness and some have greatness thrust, thrust upon them. Daddy, you have achieved greatness. You, have, you took the mantle of leadership, ran with this, and you're even greater than anyone I know. You have raised the bar very, very high regarding purposeful giving. I've never seen anyone like you in my life. There's no greater attest attestation to Daddy's giving than what we are seeing here today. You know, it, better, it built a better society for each and every one of us by the works of his hands. 
We're all standing on this edifice, which was built by one man. You know, uh, this country, this state especially, is living and is standing because of daddy's, you know, just great heart, just to leave a better legacy for each and every one of us. Daddy, we admire you. We don't know how we can ever fill those shoes. I pray God will help us. You are an inspiration to so many. You are a role model, you are a father. I really, on behalf of all my siblings, want to say how much we appreciate what you've done for us. And we pray that God will continue to give you good health, long life, to continue to do what you're doing for everyone in this world. God bless you, sir. Very grateful, sir. I don't like that applause. The applause can be a lot better. The applause can be better. I see all of the family step out now. I see all of the family step out now. This is a joy to watch. This is the family of the day, of the moment. Fantastic. This is a landmark occasion, a special day. Thank you. I am sure we all paid attention when the memorable quotes of Baba were flashed before us. One I'll take note of and reference now is the one that talks about your two hands being the greatest tools that you need for success. I want to say that that has got me thinking because when you look at all that Are Afe Babalola has achieved, you begin to wonder if indeed he doesn't have a hidden third hand somewhere. It is all just too much. And you see, that is why medical scientists, doctors today talk about robots that perform surgery. And the reason the robots are more efficient than human beings is because most of them now have three arms. And I'm sure, looking at the technological strides of this university, it wouldn't surprise me if you actually have those robots in your medical center. If you don't, I'm sure before the end of this year, from the little I've seen, you would have them here. But of all the things that uh, Fola Shadeh Ali said, the only one that I've taken away is the statement she made saying that no one ever goes to visit Baba without walking away with an envelope. Please, I need to know your address, sir. I'm coming this afternoon. I need to come this afternoon. This meeting here is not sufficient. I need to go, and then when I come and I leave there, I'll come and report to all of you what my experience has been. But I do understand that one of our very revered royal fathers would soon leave us. He's asked to be kindly excused, so we're bringing up his time on our program. And to do that, let me invite the gentleman, Mr. Tunde Olofintila, who's been assisting me to make that introduction. Thank you so very much, Henry. Yeah. Before I invite to this side of the arena, to tell us some of what he knows about the celebrants of the day, I feel like sharing this with you. When the children were taking photographs with the celebrant a short while ago, it just occurred to me 
that 66.6% of his children are lawyers. Did you hear that? 66.6% of Ari Atabala's lawyer uh, children are lawyers. That is how much you love the profession. We appreciate you, sir. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, still in the spirit of what we know about the celebrant of today, with your permission, I want to invite to this side of the arena a well-known African, an ambassador of culture, somebody who absolutely needs no introduction, one of the prime alumni of Abuad, ladies and gentlemen, put your hand together as I invite to this side of the arena, the Arule Udua, His Imperial Majesty, or Neofife, or Ba. Baba Tundi Enito, Oguwusi, or Georgia II. Let's celebrate KBC, please. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, our very humble governor, Omolu Abipa Excellence. We are all very proud of you. Nuru Kogbubori Ade, Ori Ade Agbe Yinyo, Elma Moshio. Baba Obasojo, The astute leader, elder statesman, a very irreplaceable elder statesman indeed, that God has given us not only in Nigeria, but the entire continent of Africa, we the black people. Eba Mekpate, Ofun Baba. We are all here to celebrate that I always say one man. If I have my way, I will hold this microphone for more than five hours to talk about Are Afe Babalola. I know the students are murmuring. Are Afe Babalola what? very worthy of this celebration. A very priceless elder statesman. I'm very privileged to have a personal relationship with him. A personal relationship that I look forward to coming to Abuad every time. If he doesn't hear from me, he will say, Kabi Esi, Eti Daminu, Eti Daminu, Mani Babato Da Julong Bugu Agbaye, Koshe She, Mi Oli Dainu. And indeed, you are worthy to be celebrated every day. For me, I celebrate you every day on the throne of Odudua. And I mean it. Everybody will come here and say a whole lot of things about you. But you have lived a very fulfilled life. And you are an example.
to each and every one of us, young and old. What have we used our life to do? How well have we contributed to our society? Not on this scale, in our own little way. Look at how selfless a man he is. It is very obvious. You will come to this world. At some point you will leave. But some people, we don't even want them to leave this world. Baba, as far as I'm concerned, I want to have you forever. Along about Laura I mean. Loru ko gbogbore ade Olorun aba wa da yin si ara yin a ma le o e ni sha iso Baba you are a great icon Baba you are a great icon Baba you are indeed a great icon In order to take our time, for me, as I mentioned, I celebrate you every day, and I will continue to do it. It's my commitment, and also to teach the young ones about your virtues, about what you stand for. All of us here today, we benefited one way or the other. From your wealth of experience, not only material-wise, but in so many ways, you have actually mentored a lot of people. I remember at some point, we wanted to do something for you in Lagos. I took it upon myself. I said, Baba, can you give me like 10 names? of some very close essay hand to you. Eventually, Baba gave me like 40 names. I started calling about 40 essay hands. You will not believe what happened. They started envying one another. That, Kabesi, you didn't call me. You didn't call me. Eventually, I ended up calling almost 100 essay hands in this country. Is he not a great man? Is he not a great icon? To me, you will be an icon to reckon with forever. We will do three things. All of us that are here, we will clap for Baba, we will stand up for Area for Baba Lola, and we will sing for Area for Baba Lola. And you will follow me with this stone. I have a small song to sing for Baba. If you love this great icon, say Area Fair. If you love this great icon, say Area Fair. satisfied at all. I want everybody to stand up. And you read the map, you know, Baba ten woe, want to be a want to be a law, and you can feel it do you want to see. Baba, you know, you can't wait. I want to be a law, you can't wait. You can't wait. Baba, you can't wait. 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 You will all sing this song very well for me. You will shout, Area Fair. You will dance. And you will clap. So the song goes again. Which one should we start with? To clap, to dance, or to shout? Which one? All together. Students, are you there? We should do three in one. Oh yeah, let's start with clap. 
happened? If you love this great icon, say Aria Fair. If you love this great icon, say Aria Fair. If you love this great icon and you really want to show it, if you love this great icon, say Aria Fair. If you love this That is what they call a party rouser. Certainly now we know that perhaps going forward, with the kind permission of the people of Ife, next time there is a royal party and we need just more than a superb comedian humorist, a man who can sing and perhaps dance and rouse your audience, we know where to go. So one more time, for this celebrated royal father, whom someone has described to me as the winner of the trophy for the most handsome traditional ruler in the world, let us put our hands together for the Oni of Ife. This applause does not do justice to the performance you've just witnessed. Students, are you there? Okay. So, if you love the Orni and you want to let him know, give him a round of applause.
Okay. Thank you. So we're told that our celebrant today loves music. He loves many things. And I'm sure, just looking at him, he looks like someone who would admire Frank Sinatra and maybe a Nat King Cole, the man who sang the song, Unforgettable, that's what you are. And forevermore, that's how you stay. That's why, darling, it's incredible to love someone. But we'll get there someday soon. Ladies and gentlemen, former head of state General Yakubu Gawan, GCFR, PhD, has sent us a reading letter to this occasion. We will take it after the colloquium. Not now. Time is far spent. I'm sure we don't mind being here the whole day. But please, with your kind permission, we will just take, I think, two more. Three? That's a lot. So just maybe two. Well, my co-supporter here says three. Permit us. In ten minutes, we'll be done and we can come to the colloquium. In the meantime, let me say that our keynote speaker has sat here very quietly. He's not a man that you get on the fly. But for him to leave everything he's doing to be here with us this afternoon, I want us to put our hands together for the one and only Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka. very much about band. Very quickly, may I on your behalf invite to the podium the Honorable Chief Justice of the Federation, Honorable Justice Ariwola, ably represented by the CJ of Equity State, Honorable Justice Adiyei, for his goodwill message. Very briefly. Let's celebrate the Honorable Chief Justice ably represented. Your Excellency, the Governor of Equity State, our Father, Are Afe Babarola, the Royal Fathers that are here present, distinguished guests, please permit me to stand on the already established protocol. I have the instruction of uh, the Honorable. The Honorable Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Kayode Ariwola, to represent him here. It is part of his instruction that I deliver his address. However, I would rather drop his address with the organizers of this program. It is a 10 page address. In order to save time, I will not read it. Instead, I will read his goodwill message on page 26 of our pamphlet. I read, please. My dear Lanes Sikh, it is my honor to write this congratulatory message on the occasion of your 68th anniversary of call to the bar of call to the English bar. I was delighted when I heard the news of the commemoration of 60 years anniversary of your call to the bar. Indeed, this is a rare milestone worthy of celebration, especially as the years have been dedicated to the active practice of law promotion of the rule of law and the cause of justice. I have no doubt that in the past 60 years, you have consistently 
register yourself as, as an epitome of excellence, brilliance, leadership, maturity, administrative prowess, and honesty at the bar. This is even more glaring as you continue to replicate these no main virtues among all and sundry within and outside the bar. Needless to say that your contribution to the development of law and administration of justice in Nigeria and beyond is promised interference non secondant Gives me immense joy and serve as a cause of gratitude to God that as a non-Nigerian, you continue to impart the law and society positively in many lofty respects. This rare privilege is bestowed on very few, and I'm very proud to celebrate with you and identify with all that you represent. Why wishing the Are Bamufin the very best in the tireless pursuit of the cherished virtues? It is my prayer that God Almighty continue to grant your grant you longer life, sound health, the requisite wisdom, counsel, understanding, and skills required to continue to leave footprints on the sands of time. It is my heartfelt prayer that your enviable legacies will continue to we con we live we outlive you. Once again, Are, please accept my felicitation. Yours faithfully, Honorable Justice Uluka Ode Ariwola, GCON. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is the turn of Emmanuel Chambers to say what they know about their leader, our leader, and the founder of the Chambers. To speak on behalf of all Emmanuelites, past and present, is Chief Akeolu Jimmy, CON, SAN, former Attorney General of the Federation, the oldest Emmanuelites and the, the most senior Emmanuelite present here today. Chief Olujimi, it's your turn to say a word or two about our leader. Let's celebrate Aki Olujimi, please. SAN. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is the turn of Emmanuel Chambers to see what they know about Ariya Pemala. The speaker is Chief Akiyoli Jimi, SAN. Uh, celebrant of today, Papa, Are Afe Babalola, I also salute my boss, Chief Olushagun Obasanjo, former president of this great country. I am happy 
for the opportunity to stand before you this afternoon to thank you, sir. When I say sir here, I mean the former president for the opportunity he gave me to serve under him as a minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now that came about because I am one of the professional offsprings of Are Afe Babalola. It was Are Afe Babalola who nominated me to His Excellency, the former president. It wasn't because I was in politics. I was not in politics. But they are great friends. And when there was a vacancy in his cabinet, he called on his friend, Are, to give him the name of a lawyer who can work with him. That was the way it happened. And I became a minister without being in politics. I'm happy to see you here today, sir. And I'm happy again that I'm able to thank you publicly for the opportunity, sir. Now, I want to congratulate especially our father, Are Afe Babalola. When it came, because I didn't start live as a lawyer, I rather was working with the University of Ibadan before I went to read law. So when it came for me now to do my chamber attachment, that was when I found my way into the chambers of Are. And you have had a lot said here today. He is a, is he a philanthropist. I am a great beneficiary. You see, of that nature of uh, his. Now, when I was on attachment to the chambers from the law school, he gave us an assignment, and I tried my best in that assignment. There were five of us posted to the chambers at that time. And when he saw what I wrote, he now called me to his office and said, young man, who are you? I said, sir, I am Akin Jimmy. He said, yes, I know your name, but who really are you? I didn't really know what to say, because if he knew my name and I was there in the chambers to do attachment, so what else do I have to say? to show who I was. But then I said, I am in the law school. He said, yes. I know you are there, and that's why you are here. But I read through your preparation on the case I gave you. Now, what you wrote for me, certainly if you claim to be 15 years at the bar, I will not argue with you. So where did you learn all that you put in your write-up? And I said to him, I have been reading. He said, reading. I said, yes, sir. That I did not just limit myself to what you have been taught in the law school, that I was doing extra reading, extra study. He said, yes. I think 
you will be a material for this profession. Will you like to work with me? When you finish your law school, I didn't go there to look for a job. I was posted there for law school, chamber attachment, and now an offer of job was coming to me just like that. I picked it up. I said, yes, sir. He now said, what car would you like to buy? Look at me. From law school to the chambers to learn, this offer of a job, offer of a car. Didn't know how to respond to it. He said, yes, yes, young man, tell me, tell me. OK. I said, sir. I would like to buy a 504. At that time, there's nothing like uh, uh, Tokumbo. Brand new 504. <laughs> he gave me the money to go and buy, even though I was in the law school. Oh. He gave me the money to go and buy a car. Then he said, how much is your fee in the law school? I said, sir, I have paid it. He said, yes. I know you have paid, but I want to refund it to you. I told him, and he refunded it. Then he said to me, anytime you come to Ibadan, from the law school, any weekend you come, please come to the chambers. And of course, I was doing that. And each time I went there, he would always have money to give to me. <laughs> now, that's a clear, a clear demonstration, you see, of uh, his uh, nature as a philanthropist. Now, that nature of his, up till tomorrow, up till tomorrow, is still there. Recently, one of my colleagues in the chambers, Fagwe, uh, went to greet him. When we were doing the matter here, we left the court and said, let's go and see Papa. And we came. Now, as we were leaving, he dipped his thing, uh, hand into the bus behind him and took out money. When he offered me money and my partner, we were reluctant. Then he said, ah, very rich, very rich Ekichi. He said, oh, kine koja bakun. I didn't understand what I meant. He said, yes, you don't understand. I know you are doing well. You are making money, but you cannot be richer than add this to what you have. That, that is what Papa represents, a philanthropist of note. Now, in the chambers, I know they were beckoning to me to finish uh, quickly, but I need to say one or two things here. Now in the chambers, we were many in the chambers, and today we thank God. Several SANs have passed through his hands. Many are judges at the high court level, uh, court of appeal level, Supreme Court level. But one thing about him is that he works hard and he likes you to also work hard. One of the quotes here that uh, they uh, paraded a, a while ago, there's one that I keep remembering every day, and that is, he prays most who works hardest. That's his philosophy of life. And we have all imbibed it. And that is helping us today. Now look at 
behind me here, we are just a few of those who are lucky. You see, to pass through the chambers, many are still there. Those of us who are out are benefiting today by the great name he has made and the learning we all got under him. One thing that we all here will testify to is Papa's power of cross-examination. If you have ever watched Papa in court during a trial, you will love law. Whatever, whatever edifice of lies you have built up, Papa will crush it. Papa will crush it. And I have not seen any other lawyer in this country any other lawyer in this country, past and present, who has been blessed with that power of cross-examination. <laughs> now, this university is a young one, about 13 years, I think. But see the level it has attained today Number one in Africa and uh, globally, 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 that is part of the evidence of hard work. We have very many universities older than this one in this country today, but that distinction this university has attained has no doubt shown that hard work pays, and when you work hard, there is a lot that you can gain. So it's a lesson unto all of us, the students who are here, and our juniors who are still in chambers, you have to work hard. You have to work hard. It pays to work hard. Hard work doesn't kill. It only helps you, you see, to succeed in life. So I want to thank again, Papa, what you have done for us. We love you. We continue to love you. We respect you. You are a great anchor, icon that makes us proud each time we think of you. My colleagues who cannot be here today sent their goodwill. They said, sir, because of some urgent assignments, they could not be here. But they said, since I will be here, I should let you know that they couldn't be here because of these other national assignments. I'm so grateful to you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. chambers, please come forward now and uh, do a group photograph with your mentor-in-chief, your father-in-law. Thank you. 
Time over. Photo time over. Photo time over. Please, shall we allow our celebrant return to his seat? Kindly, kindly, kindly. Can we allow our celebrant now take his seat, please? Thank you. Kenny. Ogun Miju. gentlemen. First, let me thank every one of us very much for being kind enough, patient enough to remain here with us this far in the day. You're here because you know that we are saving the best for last. Please do not lose your patience with us. Recharge yourselves and be ready for what is to come. For the highlight of today's celebration is the organization of a colloquium, i.e. a high-level formal discussion or conversation that has been put together as part of the celebration of Baba's 60 years as a lawyer. But then it leads us to ask the question, what gives anyone the right to convene a national colloquium? And what may even give a man the courage to address a topic that many fear to even whisper? The matter of Nigeria as a constitutional democracy is as controversial as it is germane to our quest for collective existence in a restructured nation. The title of the colloquium is The Future of Constitutional Democracy in Nigeria, Imperative of a New Constitutional Order. That indeed is our topic. We have a six-man panel to do justice to this and of course a keynote speaker. At this point, I would like to constitute the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, on the panel with us, I would like to invite on stage Honorable Justice Bodunde, President Customary Court of Appeal, Ekiti State. Yes, ma'am. Honorable Justice Bodunde, President Customary Court of Appeal, Ekiti State. If I have someone assist me, that would help. Yes, ma'am, you can come. Let me sit you here. All right, then. Thank you. On our panel, Alhaji Yahale Ahmed, 
former secretary to the government of the Federation. Looks like he has stepped out. We shall keep his seat. Let me then very quickly invite Leonard Silk, my brother and friend, Chief Charles Edosawa. S-A-N. Certainly, this applause is beginning to fall and is sounding weak and weak and weak. Thank you very much. So, all the people in red, you're going to be helping me out. If the applause is not coming from here, I want yours to be louder, okay? Deal? Perfect. And then, I'd like to welcome the man we all know, Mr. Femi Falano. Let me then follow by inviting Chief Mrs. Victoria Awomolo. Let me also invite to join the panel Professor Olawuyi, SAN, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Afe Babalola University, Ado Ekiti. I would like to let us know that we have a moderator for this session. He's no less a personality than Chief Adeni Akintola, S-A-N. Chief Adeni Akintola, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, is our moderator. Can anyone find us Al Haji Yayale Ahmed? We don't know he's gone. Okay. So, moderator, I think you will sit here. Yes, sir. Good. So, three to go. We do have a chairman to lead this session. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, round of applause for Chief Olusegun Obasanjo. If you ever were looking for a man with unlimited stamina, you, there he is coming up the stage right now. Another round of up. You see, you see, Baba is running through. Baba is running through, sir. Okay, just in case, please sit down. Just in case you're wondering what that is about. Where is um, Are Afe Babalola? He's not here. We need to have him here. So I am told that um, 
Alhaji Yayale Ahmed has left. But just in case you are wondering, Baba Obasanjo is asking me if the conspiracy to bring an unlearned man like him to join learned people is my work or that of Are Afe Babalola. And I don't know the answer to that, but I know certainly it's not me. So please assure our erudite former head of state that he is as learned, in fact, more learned than everyone in this house. If you encourage him with a round of applause, he will understand that we appreciate him for having earned his stripes in managing the affairs of this great and very complex country. Our celebrant is still not here, but in the meantime, I think it is now time for me to tell us. Our keynote speaker is a man I'd like to describe as a fiery force of national conscience. He is one of Nigeria's fearless truth bearers, an eloquent intellectual powerhouse, an author of many volumes. Some have described him as a positive dissident. He is a protagonist of interreligious dialogue for a more united Nigeria, a counterforce to injustice, bad governance, and social repression. He is a peacemaker, a priest of the Catholic Church, and today, Bishop of the Sokoto Archdiocese. Our keynote speaker is a highly sought after person globally. Ladies and gentlemen, it pleases me to introduce to you a man from Zangon Kataf in southern Kaduna of Nigeria. Our keynote speaker, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka. Sit out of here, please. William, one needs to go. No, no, he's here. You're here, sir. And so now. The team is set. Again, our celebrant is not here, but I'm sure wherever he is around us, he would be hearing all that we're talking about. Without much ado, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, let me yield the microphone to our moderator, or perhaps, sir, All right, so the stage is set. Let's hear now Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka speak to the subject matter, the need for constitutional reform for Nigeria. Please, a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, let me skip through the protocols, and for obvious reasons, I'm sure you understand why it's useful for me to stand on existing protocols. Um, unlike President Obasanjo, I have great advantage over him, and I'm also happy that he was called before me. He did say to you that he will get to heaven before me, and I'm really mightily happy about that, because he has to die before me to get to heaven, so I'm not in a hurry at all. <laughs> Sir, please, I'm not in a hurry. Uh, Unlike President Obasanjo, I am not afraid of lawyers. I have earned my medals with the lawyers because I have spoken at least on three different occasions over the last 20 or so years. I have addressed the National Meeting of the Nigerian Bar Association. I have also served under three Supreme Court justices, Justice Oputa, Justice Uwais, and Justice Nikki Tobi. 
So I think I have more than earned uh, my medals in law. I was struck to see Femi Falana, of all people, having to really genuflect to greet, to greet President Olusegun Obasanjo. I'm not sure that is something he did with all his heart and all his mind. Um, my job has been made very easy. My job has been made very easy because I, I think many of you must be pretty tired. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I had prepared a paper. Unfortunately, the organizers didn't tell me that uh, we were going to have a panel designed like this. So I have, I have to skip through the, the first part of my paper, which attempts to look at the whole idea of the future of constitutionalism, um, but as a process within Nigeria and also con constitutionalism around many parts of Africa. So I will skip through that in part because I think that Nigeria's history is pretty convoluted as far as constitutionalism is concerned. It's not a subject I'm an expert in, but at least I think we can pay attention to the fact that even the nature of our history as a colonial state, as a post-colonial state, also as a nation that was also fractured by a series of military interventions. Um, and as you know, every time the military came to power, the first casualty was rule of law, the first casualty was constitution, therefore the first casualty was the National Assembly. So, and every time we almost ended up like Sisyphus, because every time a military regime comes and we attempt a new order, for those of you who may not be familiar, Sisyphus was said to have ang angered the Greek gods. And for his punishment, he was asked to roll a stone up the hill. But also in punishment, every time he rolled the stone close to the top of the hill, the gods will trip and the stone will go back and Sisyphus will have to go to the bottom of the hill to start all over again. I've used that metaphor in referring to Nigeria's struggle, not only with constitutionalism, but also with the struggle for democracy. So both of them go hand in hand, so to say. So as I said, I'm not going to go through most of that. Because, but it's important to understand the nature of the political landscape of Nigeria. I've often said, rather jokingly, but I think it's important for our records, that we are perhaps one country that cannot speak about how many presidents we have had. We don't use generic terms. If we say, how many presidents have we had in Nigeria? We can say President Obasanjo came twice, one as head of state, one as president. Buhari came two times, one as head of state, one as president. Then we have head of interim government. Then we've had all kinds of... So Nigeria's constitutional history is so fractured. We've had a series of constitutions, beginning with the initiative of the British colonial, colonialists, right through to the processes that all of us are very familiar with. In my little experience, and thanks to President Obasanjo, uh, who appointed me as Secretary of the Political Reform Conference, I've had a little bit of closeness in looking at the issues and the debate. One of the most frustrating things for me in looking at the, the history of Nigeria's struggle with constitutionalism is the process itself of making a constitution. And if you compare it, and you know, the paper tries to look at that, but I probably won't go into it, is that unlike the making of the American Constitution, about which I spent a little bit of time in the paper, because the Americans, when they were making their constitution, at least, at least had sources of inspiration, whether it was the Declaration of Independence in 1776, or the American Constitution itself, which came into being in 1787, or the Emancipation Proclamation, in which Abraham Lincoln made the defining statement, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are the rights to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That means that essentially the Americans in making their constitution allowed for the fact that there has to be enough space for every individual to pursue as a matter of right life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The next is the Gettysburg speech, which Abraham Lincoln delivered on the 19th of November in 1863. And he speaks to the issues, because that is where we find our definition of democracy. So American constitutionalism drew inspiration from 
a range of scholars, whether it's Machiavelli, John Locke, the Bible itself, Thomas Hobbes, Russell, Russell, Thomas Paine, Buck, Mills, and even Karl Marx himself. And the result of all this is that you have in the American Constitution a document, although it has been subjected to amendments, but you can see very clearly that there was a historical and ideological background to the framing, from, to the framing of the American Constitution. In our own situation in Nigeria, part of our problem in my little, own little experience has been the process of even electing those who are going to talk about writing the new constitution. Now, the, the, the political reform conference that I served in, we had 400 members. Compare it to the main number of those who are to write the American constitution. And for me, one of the very interesting things, people like Thomas people like Thomas Madison and some of the framers of the constitution, it's amazing to see the depth of knowledge and the effort that people made to acquire so much knowledge preparatory to writing the constitution. Thomas Jefferson, for example, was said to have, he was, was living in France, you know, when, when the issue of writing the constitution came about. And his friend, Madison, requested that he should please help him find enough material that they will study. And his friend sent him 195 books just to prepare for this very important assignment. I make the point because if you compare it with the Nigerian situation, we are coming to participate in the making of the constitution is always at the discretion of the person who is the president. And he uses other sources of information. But I found that the struggle to represent traditional rulers, to represent the church, to represent all kinds of aggregate groups, ends up with a lot of people with very little understanding of what constitution making is. And what, I, what became very clear to me that most of the people who showed up saw the place as a theater for political and political transaction. So you can run through the Nigerian situation, but long story short, it is that first of all, there are no perfect constitutions anywhere in the world. And that in the final analysis, a constitution may be like the finest car that you can have or the finest aeroplane. It depends on whose hands it is in. I, st I stumbled on a poem, a very beautiful poem, which said that a racket is a racket, just for playing tennis. But it's not an ordinary thing for playing tennis if it is in the hands of Djokovic or if it is in the hands of Serena Williams or Venus Williams. A football is an ordinary football, but in the feet of Messi, it's a completely different tool altogether. So the point is that a constitution ought to be able to meet certain objectives and ideals. But in the final analysis, it is not so much the quality of the constitution, it is the quality of the men and women who have to operate the constitution. So I would like to, as I said, maybe run through to the end of my paper, where I raise quite a few things, because that's where I discuss what I call, what is the future of constitutionalism in Nigeria? I need to do that so that, you know, the members can have an opportunity to discuss the things that need to be discussed. The first is that let's not be exuberant about how far we have traveled on the path of democracy, in part because there were a lot of con ideological contestations around the world, especially after 1989 with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, where many African scholars were talking about the new libera liberation of Africa, because they discovered that colonialism hadn't worked by the military, successive military rules and one-man dictatorships across the continent had destroyed the foundations of our freedom, had elevated ethnicity, and created ample room and opportunity for all kinds of non-state actors to embarrass and subdue democracy. So the point to make is that the very fact that we are barely a few months since the departure of the last military general means that we must be modest in our talking about the depth of our democracy and how far we have traveled. The second point is to look at the state of Nigeria itself. Do we resemble a democracy? Do we walk like a democracy? Do we talk like a democracy? Because the very fact that up till now, months after our elections and after swearing in a president, we still don't know who is going to be the president of Nigeria after until the Supreme Court is over. Very much akin to the introduction of the video assistant referee in football 
in which case we are like a man who has scored a goal. But we have to wait for the referee to go to VAR and confirm whether it was a goal or not a goal. It's not evident. It is a symptom of how modest our claim should be. Because we very often confuse the very fact that we are in a civilian administration with the notions of being in, in, in a democracy. That our, if we cannot fix our electoral process, which is the defining law for how to choose leaders in a democracy, then we must be modest in our saying that we are in a democracy. Secondly, our judiciary is in a crisis. Crisis of perception, but also based on the experiences that Nigerians have had. It will not be surprising if ordinary Nigerians think that the only thing the Supreme Court does is to look at election petitions. Because we're looking up to the Supreme Court to help extend the frontiers of democracy and human freedoms. But very often, those institutions with Nigerians perceive that they've now become so severely you know, compromised. That has consequences for democracy and how we see the processes of democratization. We also have a raft of agitations across the country. We have seen the worst face of corruption in Nigeria. Femi Falana, my friend here, will speak about that because he's published a series of articles uh, you know, talking about, about what happened under the Buhari administration. They were not the ones who caused corruption, but I think in the last administration we saw the ugliest face of corruption in many, whether in moral terms, financial terms, or other terms. And I'll mention that before I close. We have a country that we are now sharing with bandits. Our very sovereignty, which is guaranteed in the Constitution, is under assault. Because we have non-state actors, band, whether you call them bandits or Boko Haram, it is that the entire inter you know, territorial integrity of the nation is at stake. Because nobody is excited now about being a Nigerian. Whether you are president, whether you are senator, whether you, no matter who you are, everybody is working with his, you know, with, with uh, better bread. Because we don't know, we are literally now being held hostages, you know, by people that are a threat to the very existence of our democracy and our country. Hundreds and thousands of Nigerians are still unaccounted for. They are in the hands of bandits, they are in the bushes, the Chibo girls, all kinds of things. And if the essence of our constitution is to guarantee a quantum of rights and freedom and the pursuit of happiness, what do we have to say? So when we talk about constitutionalism, we're also talking about a framework for guaranteeing, as I said, the, 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 the freedoms that that document contains. Now, the challenge, therefore, going forward is what can we do? Now, there's a lot of distrust of the, of the judiciary in Nigeria, but I consider the judiciary victims almost in the same way that every institution in Nigeria is suffering a crisis, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the church, whether it's civil society, whether it's the academia, right across the country. So the question, therefore, is I don't think we should assume that we're in a democracy. We should assume that we're marching towards a democracy, but the hard work is still undone. And that means rebuilding Nigeria after the kind of mess that the last administration has left our country, whether it is in, 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 in civil society, whether it is in the most immoral distribution of resources and opportunities in Nigeria, we know the documents are there, the evidence is there. I've got stuff on my phone that gives a count of the number of federal institutions that were planted in Daura in the last eight years, where the president comes from. I come from Southern Kaduna. Had I made this presentation as a keynote address with enough time, I would have shown you bullets. I would have shown you empirical evidence you can measure. That is that where I come from, there is not up till today, since the creation of Kaduna State, one single sign of a federal structure in, in the area of Nigeria where I come from. When you hear Nigerians talk about the South, when they talk about Southern Borno, Southern Adamawa, when they talk about Southern Bauchi, when they talk about Southern Nasarawa, when they talk about Southern Taraba, when they talk about Southern Kaduna, those areas are contiguous with the areas of poverty, neglect at the federal level. So the point, therefore, is that we need to think a little bit more clearly and much more creatively about how we can mobilize our people and how ordinary Nigerians can see that being in power is just, not just about opportunity for self-enrichment. Because the sad story, let me put it that way, the very fact that Daura has had the opportunities that it has had, it has never had since its existence. And that even Katsina, that is next door, has not seen the development that has taken place in Daura. Nothing personal, 
But just to say that we cannot run a skewed country, a country with such skewed opportunities and privileges, and pretend that we're in a democracy. So we, we look at, when, you, when you look at, for example, what I call the violation and desecration of the Constitution by even those who administer the Constitution you know, themselves. So I make the point, therefore, that restoring confidence in the professionalism of the military and moving away from seeing the insecurity as purely a military operation to addressing issues of insecurity as matters that concern everybody. You talk to senior military officers serving and retired, and there's a certain kind of feeling that in the last eight or so years, because how do you run a country in which there is absolutely diversity, management of diversity becomes the victim? A president has such enormous powers, but what do you use those powers for? I'll give you one simple example. You know, something that happened because countries change in the hands of certain presidents. Okay? As I said, I come from Southern Kaduna. We have had three service chiefs. And they were appointed by President Obasanjo, whom I must commend. I mean, he look, we look like friends, but we really have a lot of debate and argument. Uh, don't mind what you see outside. He's a man who enjoys debate, but also we confront ourselves with certain realities. But the people of Southern Kaduna remember that he's about the only one who ever appointed a minister who came from Southern Kaduna. Or he's the only one who ever appointed army chiefs who came from Southern Kaduna. So now many of you had the leaked video of uh, my former governor talking about the nature of the distribution of opportunities and so on and so forth. It's not the point. We now have an opportunity to rebuild our country. And no matter what happens, how the Supreme Court ends, how things end in Nigeria, I'm convinced that we have put the past, the ugly past, behind us. The challenge, therefore, for me and for us is to open up the frontiers of opportunity. As I said, presidents have tremendous powers. Under President Lyndon Johnson, after the death of Kennedy on November 22, uh, 1964, Lyndon Johnson took over power. And Lyndon Johnson did one of some of the most dramatic things that perhaps I believe that even if John Kennedy had lived, he probably would not have achieved, black people would not have seen the opportunities that they saw under Lyndon Johnson. And I take just one example to show you that if a president has, first of all, a president has to understand his country. Also, you have to understand where people are hurting. You also have to be a man of integrity who understands how to manage differences. The American Supreme Court was made up of white people. In 1916, Woodrow Wilson had decided that a Jew will be allowed to enter the Supreme Court. And even bringing in a Jew to the Supreme Court, the next day, it was reported in the papers that Woodrow Wilson had sent a bomb <laughs> into the Supreme Court. Now, the Jew was white. But Lyndon Johnson felt that a black man needed to be in the Supreme Court. Then he decided on Togut Marshall. Togut Marshall had expanded the, fr the frontiers of opportunity for black people through arguing the case in 1954 of Brown versus Board of Education. And there are certain seismic changes that the Supreme Court can make in terms of how people see themselves. Because that is what opened up the opportunities. But then when Lyndon Johnson became president, he wanted a black man in the Supreme Court, but he didn't know what to do because there was nobody in the Supreme Court that was about to retire. In the American Supreme Court, I think you stay until you drop. Now, the young, the, one of the youngest just, uh, you know, justices, Justice Tom, Tom Clark, he was a justice of the Supreme Court, only 67 years, but he was a good friend of the president. And Lyndon Johnson now approached him, but he went about it in the most dramatic manner. He wanted a vacancy in the Supreme Court, couldn't find it. So what did he do? His son, the son of Clark, Ramsey, was a solicitor general. A lawyer called Nicholas Katzenberg was the attorney general. The president pulled him out, gave him another assignment, and then pushed the son of Tom Clark, who was a justice of the Supreme Court, made him attorney general. And he played that psychological game because Tom Clark now had to ask himself, how will I be in the Supreme Court and my son is attorney general? 
automatically he didn't have to be told he decided to step down because he also wanted to see his son grow and it was when he stepped down that an opportunity came and then he pushed the name of Togut Masha. If you read the stories of the debate that went on in Congress, just about affirming this man, and you see that if a president wants to do good, he can do good. He has enormous powers in his hands, but his heart must be in the right place. He must also have the right reflexes to understand integrity, to understand fairness, to understand equity. Power in the hands of a criminal can only not only reinforce inequality, but endanger a whole society. Now, the process of making Togut Marshall member of the Supreme Court took a lot of effort. The president ran around in the middle of the night, blackmailed, let me, let me use that expression, intimidated, harassed his friends until they came to the table. And finally, Togut Marshall on the 2nd of September 1967 was sworn in. And in fact, the president, it was very interesting that Senator Hugo, who actually swore him in, was a former member of the KKK. The point I'm making, it didn't change much, but psychologically. So, for example, when people criticize the Supreme Court, you also understand that sometimes, like the saying goes, don't throw a stone in the market until you are sure that your mother didn't go to the market that day. And by the way, today, in three years since my mother died, I'm celebrating the anniversary of her death. May her soul rest in peace. But I'm making the point, if I had Femi Falana in the Supreme Court of Nigeria, I can go to sleep. If I have Olisa Agbakoba in the Supreme Court of Nigeria, I can go to sleep. If I have Michael Zokome in the Supreme Court of Nigeria, I can go to There are certain people that you know, you know that their presence may not solve the problem, but it creates a sense of affirmation. Today, women in Nigeria are asking for a place. And by the way, I've always supported that. I don't think women should be asking for 30%. They should be asking for 50%. But let me tell you, don't clap yet. My conclusions are different from your own. If you are going to give women 50%, and please give them 50%, but they will not be Yoruba women. They will not be Igbo women. They will not be Hausa women. They will not be Fulani women. They will be women from people like us who are not even anywhere in the Constitution. Let them be women. But we can't, because otherwise, what you do is you just continue to reinforce inequality. A system must be so fair that it understands that nobody who is a citizen is on an excursion. An excursion. Every citizen has a right. So finally, I think that the president of Nigeria must buy, because all these executive orders are meant to correct wrongs. There must be an executive order or an amendment of the constitution that defines what is the status, the religious status of the Nigerian state. And who has the right and the power to take lives without a process? We cannot have a country where somebody comes in the name of whatever may be your motivation. You can, a woman cannot say that I gave birth to this child, I carried her in my womb, therefore I'm going to kill her, even if she does, because she's exercising what she thinks is a right. The system will tell her, you may have carried her in your womb, but you have no right over her life. A country where you can just, anybody can just wake up and say, you are accused of blasphemy, you are accused of, we're not in a theocracy, we're in a democracy. There must therefore be sanctions and punishment. Because somebody goes and burns my church or burns a mosque. What are the consequences? Over 40 years now, we've been going back to rebuild our churches whenever they are born. The Nigerian state doesn't care. There must be an order that holds a governor accountable, that holds those to finding criminals who are defiling religion, who are killing people in the name of religion. They have no right to kill even their own people. So, for me, these are some of the fundamental issues. The Constitution is very clear. The Constitution is very clear about the boundaries of religion. But we have a country where, right now, as I'm talking to you, there are many uni federal universities where there are no churches, there are no mosques. What are the reasons? In many universities, land has been provided for the building of churches. But vice chancellors, Chairman of, of governing councils are turning a blind eye. 
I therefore demand that the president of Nigeria, by executive order, must say that every church, every, every worship, every system, I mean, every federal institution, whether it's medical, whether it is, it is, it is educational, must reflect what Nigeria reflects. Even if there are two Christians or two Muslims, a place must be provided for them. And I want to make this appeal. I don't know how else to make it because there are universities that are now, the universities in Nigeria, under, under you, Mr. President, you have, your good friend was vice chancellor in Amadou Bele University, Zaria. But now, universities have been so provincialized that the universities are now literally mere ethnic clubs where you cannot, the idea that Philip, Professor Philip Okonko can be vice chancellor in Ibadan, even if he's the most well connected. It's unthinkable. The fact that Afe Babalola, who has sold everything to build a university, to make him vice chancellor of either Osman Danfodio or University of Nigeria and Suka, is unthinkable. Because, like joke, like joke, we have come to a point in Nigeria where the federal government is spending money consolidating prejudices, ethnicity, and deepening the cleavages of local classes. The result, of course, is that we cannot be a people. So when Nigerians talk about ethnicity and so on, it is because the government has not done enough to enforce that. Because if you, do, if you insist that the vice chancellors, of, because the impression that governments create is that we built this university for this community. So you go to many universities, as I said, the governors, even in state universities, the governors take pride in ensuring that only our son and that is why the universities have become so convoluted in Nigeria. Every day strike, every day strike. Because people who are holding the reins of power, many of them are not eminently necessarily qualified. They are just qualified by virtue of religion or they are qualified by ethnicity. So I, I close by saying Nigeria needs to grow, Nigeria needs to develop, Nigeria needs to democratize. But that it is important that to make Nigerians treasure democracy, to make Nigerians feel confident about democracy, we must appreciate that the democratization of development, that is that the federal government must make sure that it says it has a map that tells where citizens are. Because if you don't democratize development, you cannot develop democracy. So my conclusion is that the democratization of development leads to the development of democracy. Thank you very much. Because he bears the same name, the first, first name, Pat Papa, the former president and an African leader, Chief Obasanjo. Thank you so much, sir. Of course, he has not disappointed us in any way. Those of us who have been following the trajectory, his antecedents, and what have you, he has not disappointed in any way. In fact, he has reinforced the statement he made just about two weeks ago about not having churches in some universities. I believe that statement was made by you about a week or two ago. Now, we have eminent juries and uh, 
political icons in the House to discuss the issue raised by our own uh, Bishop Matthew Kuka. Of course, because our time is fast spent, our papa, Chief Ambassador, will speak last. And when he speaks, nobody speaks again here. To that extent, I will now call on our in-house panelists, and there are quite a number of them here, six of them. Because our time is fast spent, we are going to allot to you three, three minutes. Three, three minutes to discuss the paper so that the audience will have at least the opportunity to ask three questions. That is, the question will be distributed one here, one here, and one over here. So that we'll save time, so that we can go and prepare for our lunch and tonight's dinner party. Now, in presenting this paper, which is located in the need to democratize development because we can democratize our polity. Bishop Kuka touched on a number of issues. He made reference to the American Constitution and the inspiration the Americans had in bringing about their constitution, ideological, historical, and, and the rest. But he concluded that our own constitution has no inspiration. It was a kind of ad hoc arrangement. We just gather for us up to go and put up the... And to him, those who found themselves in the constitutional assembly, in the constitutional assembly saw it as a means to an end. So, without wasting your time, I will start with our own Femi Fala Nasuna of Nigeria, who will speak to us on the issue raised, especially on the issue of corruption. For three minutes, it's a fallen office. Thank you very much. Uh, number one, uh, let me congratulate Area Feba Balala SN for bringing us together on this occasion. Uh, and to assure Bishop Kuka that uh, the ugly past is not behind us. My Lord Bishop, I need his attention. My Lord Bishop, I'm saying that the ugly past is not behind us at all. Because today, the level of corruption in Nigeria has assumed a very dangerous dimension. We have a situation where highly public, highly placed public officers steal money men for building hospitals, and people are dying on our roads. They steal money men for ecology, to fight erosion, to deforest certain part of the country. So when a country gets to that state, corruption is now a crime against humanity. And for the new government, the president must show leadership. Happily, the wife, the wife of the president said recently in Lagos, my family will have no problem with your money because we have made enough money. Therefore, I'm urging the president to lead an anti-corruption crusade so that this country, the largest concentration of black people on earth, can take its rightful place in the Committee of Nations. Right now, we are in trouble as a people. There is somebody here who was our president. If you were accused of corruption and your case was before the EFCC or the ICPC, 
you will not be appointed to a position of authority. We must go back to that era. Some of those who are going in and out of the villa are standing trial for looting the treasury of this country. So wrong signals must not be sent to our people and the international community. Uh, my Lord Bishop, and I tell you this all the time, don't agonize, but organize, my Lord. If you know a university where there is a mosque and churches are not allowed, please go to court. It is discriminatory, it is illegal, and the court will come in. The other one on women, there is a judgment of the Federal High Court, which is valid and subsisting, that women shall be given 35% appointment. In all government institutions, the judgment is not being complied with. We hope the new government will look at this. The final one, again, my Lord, if anybody is killed in this country, either by armed robbers, kidnappers, or other criminal gangs, you can sue the government to prosecute the criminal elements, and if you cannot find them, you can sue the government to pay compensation to the family. A, a young boy was killed in Ghana. Last one. Through drowning, the boy was drowned. And we approached the echo was called. And the court ordered that two fifty thousand dollars be paid to the parent. Not because the government of Ghana was guilty, but the court felt the government of Ghana did not punish those who were responsible for the drowning. Thank you very much. We are seriously under pressure here. We have to speed up. And I want to appeal to us, the panelists, to keep to time. Um, thank you so much once again, Mr. Femi Falano. Now we go to the political issue raised by Bishop Kuka. And I'm happy we have the Deputy Vice Chancellor in the house. Now, sir, Nigeria is a country where some of our compatriots think what they do not know does not exist. To them, they know everything under the sun. We've, have, we've had all sorts of exper experimentations. And Bishop Koka spoke about the inspirations with the American heart. And we don't have any. Can you say one or two things on that? My brother, Prof, and especially on the issue you raised. And please keep to time. Three minutes. Give him the mic. Thank you very much. Um, I want to first of all say a big thank you to Bishop Kuka for the very compelling and powerful lecture. I'm a professor of uh, international law, so I always like to ask, where does Nigeria stand in the League of Nations? The 2023 Global Rule of Law Index ranks Nigeria as 118 out of 140 countries in terms of rule of law, which is dangerously low. And one of the key factors is what is described as lack of constitutional legitimacy. Now, constitutional legitimacy is simply a question of how many Nigerians believe that the constitution represents their will. The first line in every constitution says, we the people, we the people. 
How many Nigerians believe that the 99 constitution represents their wish? The answer is but a few. Constitutional legitimacy is about two things. The process through which the constitution came to being in the first place and the product itself. Process and product. The 99 constitution was put together in 155 days by the Honorable Justice Nikitobi Committee. Of course, we understand that the exigencies of 1999, we all wanted to welcome democracy, may have led us to say, well, autochthony, homegrown constitution may not be our priority. But if the 99 constitution were to be standing in front of us today as a human being, it is a human being that has gone through 50 stitches. It is not healthy. The 99 constitution is a badly flawed document that does not represent the wish of the people. And I think if we really want to make progress as a country, we need to listen carefully to what Arya Pebabalola has been saying for years, the need to restructure, the need to revisit the badly flawed document called the 99 constitution, the need to look at what other countries are doing. I'll end with an example of Kenya. Kenya had its election recently. Before the president was sworn in, the case was concluded. And everyone is praising them. How did they achieve this? That is thanks to the 2010 referendum, which led to an homegrown constitution. I think the Nigerian people deserve an homegrown constitution that represents their wishes. Thank you very much. The DPC, thank you so much. Now, Bishop Kuka spoke about the need for us to democratize development across the country. He drew attention to the fact that where he came from, the area of his origin has no single federal infrastructure. And you are talking about democratization, according to him. That goes so far to buttress the, the postulation of Confucius, the great Greece, Greek, who said, every question has more than one answer. To Bishop Kuka, democratization without the development is, is no dem democracy. So, uh, Mr. Femfalano, Senior Secretary of Nigeria, until the leader leads by example, we cannot make headway. But he believes that everything and everything must resort to court room. Uh, if you ask me, there will be so many responses, so many answers to those issues. Not, uh, not Many people will buy the idea postulated by Bishop Kuka when he was speaking about women, gender, and uh, their demands of 35.5%. Uh, you know, we had in this country a president, I'm not mentioning anybody's name, who was a worker colleague. He lives by example. He was president. When he gives you assignment, he will supervise what you are doing. We've had another president who doesn't supervise. They call one a dictator, and they call one an idle president. I leave it at that. So, so the issue of women gender, which Bishop Kua alluded to, may I call on Mrs. Uh, Aouma, the senior advocate of Nigeria. Of recent, of recent, the women are practically taking over the legal profession. Thank you very of, much. Of, of recent, your compatriots uh, uh, in the skates, in skates have taken over the, women, women, uh, the legal profession as a life venture. I know as a fact that 65 to 67 percent of those who are calling to the bar are females. Yes. Now, speak to that against the backdrop of the fact that practically all the Ministry of Justice in Nigeria today have been taken over by female lawyers. 
in this region, Southwest, four of our CJs are women. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Let me also congratulate Daddy on this auspicious occasion. And I pray for long life. And that those things you are still wishing to achieve, God will give you the grace to achieve them. Let me go into that. You have just brought out the judiciary alone, which appears to be doing well for women. And the statistics are there. In the Federal High Court, the Supreme Court, look at the percentage of women at the Supreme Court. Very low. Since the inception of the Supreme Court, only eight women have risen to the Supreme Court, and only one had risen to be the Chief Justice of Nigeria. At the Court of Appeal, we've had two women in a row become the President of the Court of Appeal. At the state levels, well, very well, but if you look at the totality of the, of the percentage, it is still very, very slow. It's very low. Because at the Federal High Court, we have only 26% of the judges as women. At the NICN, you have only to about 25. But summing it all, that is only the judiciary that has traveled, maybe because women find the work of the judiciary easier. But come to core legal practice, how many women have risen to the top? So the top of the profession, out of 73 senior advocates of Nigeria, only 33 are women. And many of these women are those in the academia, not in the core legal practice. But coming to the constitutional development of Nigeria, as the keynote speaker has said, women have not been treated fairly at all since the inception of, of democracy in Nigeria. And we have had cause to speak out, to cry, to present bills, to, 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 to organize ourselves. But it has been from one poor state to a poorer state. Look at the present National Assembly. At the last National Assembly, there were about 10 at the Senate, out of 109 senators. Now, as I speak, there are only three women at the Senate, at the Senate of Nigeria. At the House of Representatives, there are only 10 or 11 women out of, out of 360 people there. So how have we fared when the Constitution of Nigeria guarantees equality in discrimination and gives equal treatment to men and women, and that we should not discriminate on account of sex? So what is the problem? The five bills that were presented to the National Assembly last year were all rejected. These were called gender bills. They were all rejected because we had the overpopulation of men at the National Assembly. One of the bills said, if I marry a Nigerian, if a foreigner married a Nigerian man, the man automatically become, may, may apply to naturalize. But if I, a, a foreigner marries a Nigerian woman, it is not possible for that man to natural to, to natural to that woman to, to, to the man to naturalize. Thank you. And we have we've been asking, and that's a court judgment on the thirty-five percent affirmation. Thank but you, in all our governments, Thank nothing you, has been Mr. Done. Thank you so but much. But let me give an example of Kwara State and Kogi State. In Kwara State, as I speak, there's a law on, on the affirmative action that every appointment in government of Kwara State must, come, must be filled by at least 33% of gender, male or female. And he backed it up with a law. In Kogi State, although there is no law, but what is currently happening is that the vice chairman of every local government in the 21 local government areas of Kogi State are women. The SSG is women, is a woman. The, 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 the head of service is a woman. And there is a systemic and agenda Thank you. for mainstream women into the governor. And up. so these people are growing. That's Can we replicate this in all governments of Nigeria and our, make women our, to our, grow? Our time is fast, fast gone. Thank you. It's nice hearing that. 
it's nice hearing that, getting that information through you, that Kuala State has gone ahead, other states. I hope the other states are taking note of that. Now, Chief Shaz. It does say why. Sinakit of Nigeria. Bishop Kufa spoke of the need to have men of integrity by his own estim estimation, the likes of Fenfala and SAN, and the likes of Agbakuba that should be on the Supreme Court. Against the backdrop of the fact, which you know very well, that over the years, attempts have been made to inject people from the bar to the apex court without trying to, uh, to praise our papa, former president, I am aware by virtue of my position that he made that attempt, but he did not see the light of the day. What is your conclusion on this? On that, Bishop Kuka said there is a need. He said, among other things, that judiciary is in crisis. I now to find some solutions that pe people will have confidence by its own estimation that people will develop confidence in judiciary once they start having men like Femi Falano or Agbakoba. You heard him say that. Now, again, the backdrop of the fact that MBA and, in fact, our former president made attempts to inject people from the bar, from outside the mainstream. What is your contribution to that? Well, um... I've, I have read that question a few times. I think we've gotten it wrong because we have allowed uh, the principles of appointment, judicial appointment, to be taken away from a constitutional principle of appointment to promotions. That is what it is now. If you read the words of the Constitution, the Constitution talks about appointment. Appointment. Somebody who is 10 years old becomes a high court judge upon appointment. Somebody who is 15 years old goes to the Supreme Court upon appointment. I think 12 years for the Court of Appeal. But somehow, in the works, in the works, an institution was created, they now, they now brought other criteria for appointment of judges. So a judge who now wants to go to the Court of Appeal is waiting to be promoted from the High Court to the Court of Appeal. A judge wants to go to the Supreme Court, is waiting to be promoted from the Supreme, uh, Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court. That is not what the, the, the Constitution provided. Otherwise, why shouldn't a brilliant Attorney General go to the Supreme Court, just like Justice Namani did? Why wouldn't a brilliant professor go to the Supreme Court, like Brandis did? Like, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. Yeah, yes, like, like did. You know, so... so when they created those other criteria, in fact, the feeling is not that um, if you're a legal practitioner, you have no place in the Supreme Court. I remember a few years ago when I was part of the NBA screening committee to screen some legal practitioners for appointment to the Supreme Court. I think that was also, uh, the, the way that was done was also wrong, in the sense that people were asked to apply to be, to be appointed in the Supreme Court. I refused to apply. You don't apply to be appointed in the Supreme Court. So guess what happened? All sorts of applications came. You get nominated. Well, hold on. A deputy chief registrar, who is not yet a high court judge, was applying to be appointed in the Supreme Court. As somebody who works in the bank, because he has 15 years at the bank, was applying to be appointed in the Supreme Court. You know, so all sorts of, it became an affair for all comers. But the truth is this. The truth is this. Let us keep fidelity with the words of the Constitution that says, the president appoints a justice of the Supreme Court upon a recommendation of the NJC. But the way it is now, we've turned it on its head. If, you, if the NJC does not recommend, you do not appoint. So where is the power of appointment when a recommendation can override it? But even though there is nowhere. So we keep getting people with bad habits from the magistracy up to the Supreme Court. I'm not calling any names. I've not said anything. But my point is that if you have somebody who has already acquired bad habits in the magistracy, promoted to the high court, you, you, you compounded the bad habits, promoted to the court of appeal, they ultimately get to the Supreme Court. What magic are you looking for when the person gets to the Supreme Court? Thank Is he going to meet Mr. P. Fanning in the Supreme Court to say, oh, I'm not a good judge, 
because I've been promoted, I've done it the Supreme Court. It doesn't work like that. Thank you so much, Chief Federico Asinaki of Nigeria. Uh, the law remains as it is. The presidency has the power to appoint justices of the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court. The governor has the power to appoint judges of the state high court. But everything depends on political will. Thank you so much. And the last issue taught by Bishop Kuka, which is going to be addressed by our own president of the Court of Appeal, court of Appeal which is the state, Justice Tony Bodunde, is the social issue. The needs for social justice. And you made reference to discrimination. Can you say one or two in that? Because our host of today, our celebrant, has written so much on that. For those of us who have been following our Rafael Balaut's writings on the pages of newspapers, he had over the years spoken about social justice. Can we hear from you, sir? Thank you very much, brother and moderator. And I'm standing on all existing protocols because of time. I really did not know why I was brought up to the podium. But I want to say that um, I trust that it must have been the celebrant's decision. Because on one or two occasions, as a father and um, a daughter, we have had one or two discussions about using law as social engineering or social justice, like you said. Um, from example of Baba, we can say that he has used law not only as a legal practitioner, but he has used law in education, in medicine, in business, and the examples abound. For me personally, law must have a social face. And one of the areas that it can have a social face without being, um, uh, without being a judge in my own case is the area that my learned sister Silk talked about. I would say that AKT has done very well. There was a time in this state when I used to be the only female judge, when the likes of Honorable Justice Omoleye, Justice Fasomi, were appointed as judges of the Court of Appeal. And then for 14 years, there was a coma in appointment of women as judges. And then between last year and now, we now have three female judges, two in the High Court. I was appointed from the High Court to pioneer the newly created Cosmic Court of Appeal. And I have another female judge. So it is not doing badly. However, like I know my father, the celebrant, who wants me to be courageous today to talk about, there is an issue, an area where we can use law as social justice. And that is the area of the access to justice and the, and the, and the, the, the devices, if I want to say, that is still linked to some of our cultural and traditional practices. What do I mean? Like in the area of female genital mutilation, for instance, and widowed practices, this is a kitty. We have done very well with other aspects of gender-based violence. But the issue of female genital mutilation, the issue of our widow practices needs to be visited. And these are things that are not of common law nature. They are rooted in our practices. 
So it is an opportunity to appeal to our royal fathers. Kabi sisters, Adia Kwelori Yisao, Bata Kwelese. It is an area that they can come in to help stakeholders in the administration of justice to look at. Female genital mutilation is a no-no in a kid's state. Thank you, my lord. Let me just do your body day. As we are landing up, uh, I've been told that my brother's sake, Penfalano, has an information to give. Just information, one minute. Please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, because we are talking of discrimination against women, in Lagos now, men are complaining of reverse discrimination. Out of 69 judges in Lagos, high court judges, only 24 are men, 45 are women. Wait, wait. Out of 152 magistrates, 44 are men, 108 are women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fen Valano. Uh, I want to call on our referred father, Chief Felicia Gobasanjo, the chairman of this session, to speak to us. Over to you, sir. I, I will want to. we want to get off because this is very important subject and um, I want to thank Bishop Uka for the points he made on this subject constitutionalism and democracy Well, he said he wants to beg you to keep quiet. Can I beg you? You see, you don't have to beg them. I can beg them. Thank you very much for keeping quiet. Bishop Kuka made very cogent and valid points. Constitutionalism he said there's no perfect constitution. Democracy, it is a journey, it's not a destination. But constitutionalism, no matter what constitution you have, and democracy, no matter the system that you employ in your democratic uh, way of life, if you do not have good governance, which must be the outcome of your constitutionalism and your democracy, then you are not going anywhere. And he made the point too, that then to get good governance, it will depend on those who are operating your constitution and who are managing your democracy. And that is very important. The people who are operationalizing your constitution and your democracy. And the point in Nigeria, which I have seen, which I can, which I can attest to, is most of the people, most of the people, who are supposed to be operationalizing or managing and who have seen the constitution and democracy move forward. They are actually the ones who undermine constitution and let me give an example here. 
all elected people by our constitution. The uh, emolument is supposed to be fixed by revenue mobilization and um, uh, uh, commission. But our lawmakers set that aside and they make law and put any um, uh, emolument for themselves. Even if that is constitutional, it is not moral. And of course, it is neither constitutional nor moral. Now, when you have a situation like that, then what do you say of constitution, which is preached by those who are supposed to be guardian of constitution and democracy? That is one. The thing, again, that is, to me is very important is there are so many other aspects of our Constitution that are actually absolutely ignored. Take federal character. We have federal character commission. I don't know if federal character commission has come out to find anybody guilty of not really keeping federal character. Uh, have they all kept federal character? Of course, no. Of course, no. Now, the point is that if you leave the Constitution breached, then, of course, you know what happens next. Bishop Puka talked a lot about the American Constitution. And the first point about American Constitution, it talked about every person being born equal. Not even every citizen. Every person who lives in America, whether you are a citizen or not, you are supposed to be enjoying the constitutional rights of America. But with us, the, constitutional, uh, the Constitution is breached. We have no democracy that delivers. Your democracy must deliver the dividend of democracy. And if your democracy does not deliver the dividend of democracy, then it becomes anything goes. Anything goes for anybody. So I believe that constitutionalism, democracy, must lead to good governance, and good governance must deliver for the welfare and the well-being of the people. That is what the Constitution, democracy, and all the other things are meant to achieve. But this I will also say, leadership at all levels requires certain things. Character, understanding, knowledge, sacrifice. And if these are not there, we are deceiving ourselves. No matter what constitution we have, no matter what sort of democracy we practice, the each, all this must lead to one thing and one thing only. The welfare, the well-being, the prosperity, the security of the people. 
And if we cannot manage diversity, which we seem not to be able to manage, it doesn't matter what you talk about constitution, it doesn't matter what you talk about democracy. In fact, like one young man said to me, he said, now democracy will go chop. If he has nothing to, shop, to eat, if he has no job, if he has no uh, security, and you are telling him of democracy, the answer you will get is that now democracy mango chop. Democracy doesn't mean anything to any man who is hungry. Democracy doesn't mean anything to any man whose life is in danger. Democracy does not mean anything to any man whose property is being destroyed. Democracy, a constitutionalism, democracy, good governance must lead to the welfare and well-being of all the people, particularly the common people. Ladies and gentlemen, on that note, I think it would be right to say that this colloquium has been brought to a fitting close, and I ask all of us then to put our hands together in a resounding applause for our chairman, the keynote speaker, the moderator, and of course, the distinguished panelists. We want to take a picture. Let him come. No, let, let him come. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go down to take a picture with our birthday boy um, talking about 60 years at the bar. Whilst that is ongoing, please let me point out, I'm holding this ring in my hand. I think somebody forgot it in the bathroom. So if this is yours, it looks pretty expensive. Looks pretty expensive. I don't want to possess it. But after now, we'll be sending it to the CSO of the university. So please, if this gold ring is yours, kindly come and identify yourself, proof of ownership, and you can have it. In the meantime, we would like to invite a very young lady who is a theater and media arts 200 level student of the Akiti State University. Her name is Sharon Akomo Lafe, and she has composed a song for our celebrant, and she comes on stage now to perform it. Thank you. to our Papa, Are Afe Babalola, he is a blessing to the whole nation and to the world at large. Um, so please sit back and enjoy.
Thank you very much. That's just um, a little bit of what we can have. Maybe later on we can find the time to reinvite the girl. Meanwhile, we now have a book to present to all of us this afternoon. And may I very quickly invite the book reviewer. His name is Chief Dr. Ogu James Onoja, S-A-N. Ogu James Onoja, please round of applause for him as he comes. celebrant, our father, Are Afe Babalola, yes, all the excellencies present, my Lord, spiritual and temporal present, may I with respect stand on the existing protocol. Because of the lack of time, I will not want to go into the detail of this book review. We will give the, the specific that are most important. One of the things that I recognize this today is that why the biological fathers, the biological children of our daddy was recognized, some of us that are the adopted sons and daughters were not recognized. Ari is a father to all of us. It's a great privilege for me to review this book today, the book titled The Diamond at the Bar, which is a celebration of the life and times of our father and 60 years as a lawyer in this country. I am delighted to stand here today to review this book. And Without wasting more time, I want to go into the, the nitty gritty and the ingredients in this book. The Diamond at the Bar is a 416 page book with 53 chapters. In terms of appearance and aesthetics, I must say that it is a well produced book. As an author and publisher myself, I must commend the editors and publisher for this feat. The book is easy to read and well printed. The font used in printing the book is friendly to the eye, and one does not need to strain the eyes to read it. The starting point in my review is unique features of this book, which I don't want to waste time on it, because the book is here, you are going to see it. So I don't want to go into the aesthetics of this book to tell you what it contains. The learned, my learned brother, Sikh, Professor Michael Zikume, authored the foreword to this book. And if you read the foreword, it's encompassing, very detailed in terms of what the book contains and the importance of this book. It's also to be noted that His Excellency Governor Biodu Oyembaji gave a detailed and engaging piece, which is an eye opener on what our father here stands for today. I found in the course of reading the governor's chapter a narrative of how Are indirectly contributed to the governor's academic success in the university, which related to here today, and also what the governor told us today about the role of our father in the uh, formation of this state, in the founding of this state, is also contained in this book. If you get it, you get the real details there. And also in chapter three, we have the written by our leader in the bar, Shiwole Olani Kweku, who is a commander of the Federal Republic. He reviewed so many facts about our father here today, the celebrant, which are contains in chapter three of the book. You read it, you get all the details. Because of time, I will not be able to give you all the details as contained in this write-up. 
The unique things we are going to discover in the peace contributed by His Excellency Babatule Fashola is in Chapter 4. It contains the celebration of Are himself and his contribution to, to uh, arbitration in Nigeria. What he stands for in the arbitration in Nigeria is a contribution given by Babatule Fashola, SCN, former Governor of Lagos State and former Minister of the Federal Republic. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, if you want to discover an intimate portrait of Are as a father and in the house and in the office, you should look no further. Read what Prince Latif Fagbemi wrote on in page 47 to 55 of the book. And then also you read what uh, our our bishop, Bishop Kuka, also wrote, the future of constitutional democracy in Nigeria, imperative of a new constitutional order. This is the lecture we got today. Some of them are also contained in the book. Then there is also a contribution by Most Reverend Felix Femi Ajekaye. It's a chapter also in this book. When you get it, you read it. Then we have contribution for His Imperial Majesty, Oba Adeyeye Enito Oguwisi, who, who also came here to display today for us in celebration of our father. Our royal host for today, the Ewi of Adwekiti, Oba Rufus Adejube, is also very categorical in what he wrote about our father today. It's also contained in the book. The same sentiments he echoed also was stated by his Oba, Oba Dr. Adesanya Adejare, the ally of Balufun, ally of Efun State. He also stated the role and the importance of this celebration in the love of our daddy today. Also, there are so many things written about the judiciary here. They are also contained in this book, particularly if you look at page 172 of the book, uh, we have a contribution by his lordship, Justice Ayodeji Daramola, they are also contained in this book. This book practically contains so many contributions by eminent jurists, eminent professors, and legal practitioners in this country. It's a compass in this book, the like of Professor Zekome is also there. Our father in the profession, Chief Adeyebo Awomolo, also made a contribution. You see the contribution of people like Joseph Bodorin Daudu, and Chief Akin Olijimi, our father also in the profession, the former Minister of the Federal Republic. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, without wasting our time here, you will know that the, 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 what the review will not be complete if I fail to highlight the contributions of four Amazons, because we are talking of women power today. We discuss about women power. There are contributions by women here, uh, my senior Mrs. Funke Adekoya, SCN, and also Yeye Asiwaju Victoria Awomolo. Ladies make very good contributions in this book that we are going to launch today. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, if I may allow also today, we need to acknowledge one thing here today, that our father we are talking about today, which has all this all these writings, all these commentaries, all these praises today we are celebrating, that is a daddy to all of us. I will call him the daddy general of the Federal Republic and the Commonwealth. Everything that he stands for in the society I encompass here. People have been giving their own testimony. I also want to state here that I'm a beneficiary of his generosity. Anytime I come to visit him here, he will try to give me transfer money. When I say, Daddy, I am loaded, I carry money, he says, you must receive your own. So I will gladly refer to him today as a father whose humility has humbled all of us. He is a father whose intellect has dwarfed all of us. He is moral, will moralize all of us. His generosity has bring us pure joy. He is an area father. He is a father without jurisdiction. He is a father at large. 
our man we are celebrating today is a father without jurisdiction. This book is loaded. I recommend it for all of you, and I wish you happy reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Please, can I appeal to all of us, especially our ushers and persons who are busy distributing the goodies. Your distribution style is creating a lot of ruckus in the hall. If we can suspend that for a little, please, we ask of you to bear with us. We will be done as quickly as possible. Can we please stay quiet? We'll be done in a bit. You've been wonderful. I want to thank you for being so patient. Kindly, kindly suspend the distribution of the food bags so that we can quickly wrap this up. On that note, I would like to very quickly invite our chief launcher for today. But as he comes up, let me let it be known that the proceeds from this book launch will be going towards the establishment and support of the Abwad Museum. The Abwad Museum will be the direct beneficiary of the proceeds from the book launch. Let me therefore very quickly invite the chief launcher, Dr. Taiwo Afolabi. He's not here, but will be represented by Captain I.B.A. Ulubade, Executive Director, CFAX Group. Executive Director, CFAX Group, can we have you up on stage, please? Please support the Executive Director CFAX Group with a round of applause. We will try as much as possible to keep the launching as quickly as possible, very short and straight to the point. Thank you. I pleaded with us to maintain some silence, please. The ladies distributing food, can you please stop for now? Please. Your Excellency, good afternoon, sirs. Uh, well, Royal Majesty is here. I greet all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here representing Dr. Taiwo Afolabi, who should have been here himself personally, but um, lost somebody last uh, yesterday morning, so he couldn't make this trip. So if you permit me, let me read his um, good read message before I now do the launching of the book. These remarks of Dr. Taiwo Olayinka Fulabi, M-O-N-C-O-N, the chief launcher at the public presentation of the Diamond at the Bar, a chronicle of lessons and values from the life of Are Afe Babalola. Your Excellencies, let me start by congratulating our father, the celebrant and the honorary of today, Are Afe Babalola, the Are Bamofi of Yoruba land on this milestone anniversary of his call to the bar of England and Wales. Attaining 60 years at the bar is, very, is a very standard landmark. When we recall that in public service, 60 years is the age of retirement, we can then better appreciate the event of today. It means in effect that anyone born in 1963, the same year that Are was called to the bar, will be leaving the public service this year. In other words, Are Afe Babalola has been a lawyer for the whole of the, of the life of many of our public servants. That is a huge achievement. We have all listened with rapt attention to Dr. Ogu James Onoja, son, 
our distinguished book reviewer, as the learned senior advocate of Nigeria, expertly provided us with a critical review of the book, The Diamond at the Bar, a chronicle of lessons and values from the life of Are Afe Babalola. I cannot but agree with Dr. Onoja that the list of the contributors represents the Hall of Fame in Nigeria. I don't think there's a name of any of the contributors that is not familiar to even the younger child in the country. From our father, Baba Odushagun Obasanjo, to Governor Abiodun Oyebanji, to KBSC, the Ooni of Ife, to KBSC, the Ewe of Ado, to KBSC, the Alaye of Efon Alaye, and then to my lords, Bishop Kuka and Bishop Ala Ajakaye, then to the doing of the legal profession, Asiwaju Wale Oladi Pekun, Ashiwaju Adeboyega Owomolo, Chief Akin Olujimi, Chief JB Daudu, and others too numerous to mention. For all these giants of our country to come together to produce this monumental book in honor of Are is certainly a testimonial to Are's gigantic achievements. This is not my first time of visiting Abuad. I've come here at the instance of Are some years ago. However, I've, I must admit that I was more than marvel at the tremendous changes that taking place between the, the last time I was here and what I'm witnessing here today. I could not believe my eyes at the giant structures that have since sprung up all over the campus. If my recollection is, collect, is correct, the White Rock, which now houses Baba's offices, was not there some years ago. There was also no Afebabalala's multi-systems hospital when I came here the last time. There was also no Abbott Industrial Park at the time. And now, in a twinkle of an eye, Are has waved the magic wand, and an African forest has been transformed into a city. I do not think I have come across any other institution, be it public or private, that is growing as such a supersonic speed. In his concluding remarks, Dr. Noja San said something that which makes an impact on me. He said that the book we are unveiling today is a book that documents the human and leadership principles Are Afe Babala has, has lived his life by, as recorded by selected illustrious people who have been privileged to interact with him. That's a profound statement. It means, in effect, that anyone who aspires to be a legend and a giant in his uh, profession must get a personal copy of this book. I believe that it is a book like this that we must encourage our children and students to be reading at this critical junction of our national history. The younger generation must understand that there is no shortcut to sources. They must understand that it was not only a room that was not built in a day. The impressive and prestigious Afebolola University was also not built overnight. It takes vision, tenacity, and hard work to become, to become a source. Your Excellencies, it is the light of the foregoing that in launching this book, and we want to donate copies of the book to Abbott Library, as well as the Library of University of Lagos, where I obtained my LLB degree, the Library of Ladoke Akintola University of Technology, where I was given my first honorary doctorate degree, the Library of Nigerian Law School, where I was called to the bar, and other universities across the country. It is my hope that the book will become a recommended reading text in all our institutions of higher learning. I believe that this is one of the best ways to ensure that the lessons from the life of our Are Afe Babalola become a national ethic. I thank you for listening, and I congratulate our Are Afe Babalola on this lifetime achievement. So in, in launching this book, I've been directed to launch some copies of this book with 10 million naira. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may I, with your permission, invite to this side of the arena, the man we are celebrating today, Arafa Babala, his wife, former president of Basunjo, governor of Ekiti State, and Arivad, a way of Ekiti, to please unveil the books. The celebrant, his wife, Baba Obasanjo, the governor of Ekiti State, and a way of Ekiti to please help us unveil the books. Thank you.
as the representative of the army of Ilori, the celebrant, his wife, former president of Basunjo, the governor of Ekiti State, and the vice chancellor of the university, VC Abad. So please, the upcoming to unveil the book. Please, sir, come to the state to unveil the book for us. With the unveiling of the book, may I very quickly invite the representative of First Bank here, the representative of Union Bank, Fidelity Bank, Zenith Bank. Please, if you're here, just get ready, come forward and um, support the launching of this book. Mr. Gbenga Oyebode, if you're still here with us, this is your time to speak to us. The NBA president, the representative of the NBA Adoikiti branch, NBA Akure, NBA Ibadan. The AWI of Adoikiti, representative of Emmanuel Chambers, MDCEO Top Fingers, medical director Crown Hospital, and also medical director Oroki Hospital. If you're all here, Please come forward now to support the launching of this book. One more time, representatives of First Bank, Union Bank, Fidelity Bank, Zenith Bank, Mr. Binga Oyebode, the NBA President, NBA Adoikiti, Akure Ibadan. And Governor Oyebanji, the Governor of Ekiti State, Perhaps you want to please come and support the launch of this book, Your Excellency. Yes, sir. You can just do the major stuff and then we can all go home. Okay, it is not often that we have the President of Nigeria, 
representing a former president of Nigeria, I must say, representing someone. This afternoon, our big daddy, Olusegun Obasanjo, has just whispered to me that he has been sent by his small son, Mr. Gbenga Oyebode, to announce Mr. Oyebode's donation of the princely sum of 5 million naira. And then since uh, Baba was the one that uh, brought the message, Baba, sir, your excellency, sir, sorry, sir. I think they said I should ask you your own donation, sir. Yes, sir. No, 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 don't do that. Uh, no, Baba will tell us something. Baba will tell us something. Baba is not shy of, um, yes, Baba will do tell us something. Chief Olusegun Obasanjo, one million naira. Mr. Femi Falano, don't go, please come. No, come, 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 come. Yeah, 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 Mr. F Meanwhile, the book reviewer is supporting this launch with the sum of one million naira. Mr. Femi Father, sir, this is the way to the stage. Well, um, as I did say, I'm happy to be here on this occasion. I've been here all day. If I were to charge a client for being here all day, I would be talking of some millions. Uh, I do not, as a policy, announce donations because the tax people may be around. Uh, I'm going to buy copies so that People can read the book. I'm going to buy copies and I'm going to distribute them and also find out from whoever is unlucky to get a copy from me. Because I'm going to call them to make sure they have read the book. I'm going to take, uh, since I said I wasn't going to announce anyway. No, no, no. no. Uh, I'll talk to my friend. Uh, my friends are there. Just be sure, I'm going to buy copies handsomely. <laughs> when a handsome man decides he wants to buy something handsomely, you can be sure that the handsomeness will be reflected in the number of zeros after the figure. So let us give uh, Mr. Femi Falano seven rounds of applause in support of the handsomeness of his donation. Thank you very much. I have a check in my hand here. It's from your sister university, the Eliza Day University, and I have it here, a check made out to the Afe Babalala University, Adwe Giti, 500,000 Naira. 500,000 Naira. Mr. Oni, former governor, are you here with us, sir? Are you happy to come on stage, please? Kindly come, kindly come, very quickly. It will be good, it will be good, trust me. Please, a round of applause for the former governor of Ekiti State. Well, I want to stand on existing protocol. I... I'm going to launch the book on behalf of some of my friends. 
uh, who are also Baba's uh, children, together will pull together half a million, myself and those friends. I won't list them now, but we'll pull together half a million and launch it. A round of applause for the former governor, 500,000 on behalf of himself and his friends. Can I see any hands up? Yes, please come, please come. This is the time we're looking for courageous and brave people. Ah. Chief Sashere of Adwekiti. Yes, sir. Abiyasi. On behalf of the AWI of ADO and the entire members of AWI in council, we are launching five copies for one million naira. Yes. That is the kind of man I like. Straight to the point, very direct. And of course, I believe, yes, indeed. Ah, this is um, support from the name on the check reads to Lulope Francisca Akinyemi, 500,000 naira. Okay, I hear that that's on behalf of Fidelity Bank. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. It's a great pleasure being here today. And all protocols observed. On behalf of myself and family, and my business, Financing and Partnership Africa, I'm putting a token amount of one million naira. Only before about... I have like four, four, uh, four feet of them. Okay. Please. Thank you very much. One million naira. Four, 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 four copies. Four copies. Four copies. One million naira. We want to thank you very much. Please, can we have the MDCEO Top Fingers? Is it Top Fingers now or Crown Hospital? Crown Hospital, Oroki Hospital. Yes, sir. I like this, your Akbada, sir. Very nice. Okay. Uh, the donation must fit it too. Very good. Let me stand on the existing protocol. As a friend of the university, one of Baba's sons, a parent of the university, on behalf of myself, my wife, and the entire members of my organization, Top Fingers Investment Limited, Nigeria and China, we are going to launch 10 of the books with 5 million naira. I told you this man was going to perform. Just looking at this is Abad, I knew that I wasn't wearing it for nothing. Another round of applause for him, please. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so I have um, two medical practitioners here, I believe. The Chief Medical Director, Crown Hospital. Yes? Are you coming together? Okay, and the Chief Medical Director, Oroki Hospital. Who speaks first? Well, um, all protocols observed. I'd like to speak on behalf of Crown Hospital and Oroki Hospital. And uh, we are putting down a sum of half a million naira. Thank you. For both of you? For both of you. Uh, uh. No, 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 no. Abere <laughs> Langu. A round of applause for the two MDCEOs. And then I have. Um... Thank you so very much, Henry. Chief Nii Akintola, S-A-N-C-O-N, 2 million naira. Chief Latif Agbemi, S-A-N, 2.5 million naira. Thank you. Uh, please, Chief Awomodo, they say I should invite you, sir. A round of applause for Chief Awomodo, his wife, his son, his wife, his son. Yes, Chief and Chief Mrs. The two put of you together. You must announce a double barrel donation. He says you should come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quick, 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 quick. 
Okay, okay, okay. Mm hmm. Please just support us, support us. Please support us. Ah, this one is major. Baba's children have vexed. Eh? On behalf of JG Ali, Timi Austin Peters, Kofo Maje Kodumi, the pledge in hand is for 10 million naira. Huh? Where is the information that's lacking, waiting for me? He's coming. And I hope somebody's keeping records. You're wearing a bow tie. Come now, come, come, come. You don't want to come? And, and, please help me take a note from the gentleman with the bow tie. Right there. Yes, sir. Can you donate the microphone to me? Chief and Chief Mrs. Awomolo, one million. Mr. Lakwita and family, one million. Thank you. I have here in my hand Dr. Olumide Ayani, SAN. He wants two coffee, copies for the sum of 250,000 naira. I would like to stand on the existing protocol on behalf of my wife, Lady Yola Mujiba Bakari. She's one of Baba's uh, adopted daughters. And myself, Saola Dipo Bakari, I'm going to pick up five copies for one million naira. Thank you. Five copies, one million naira. Chief Mrs. Margaret Oguntala, the first lady on stage. Putting money where money is needed. Come this side now. Come, 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 come. Let them appreciate you. How are you today? Fine. Excellent. So speak to us. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The Nigerian Society of Engineers has come to celebrate with Baba today. And on behalf of the society, I... Engineer Margaret Oguntala, the deputy, uh, deputy president, president-elect, hereby launched the book. We we'll take five books for 500,000 naira. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Margaret. Thank you very much. Chief Judge, Judge Federal High Court is buying, on behalf of the totality of his colleagues, is buying 10 copies for 500,000 naira. The book reviewer, where are you, sir? Oh, he has done one million. Kenny, from the crystal ball in front of me, the gentleman in bow tie. The gentleman in bow tie. Yes, sir. It's your turn to speak, sir. Thank you. On behalf of the MBA. Good afternoon, everyone. I think we've done justice to protocol today. So I won't bore us with protocol other than to especially appreciate everyone who had come here this afternoon, in fact, since this morning, to celebrate not just the great icon, but the greatest icon of all time in this legal profession as far as this country is concerned. And I think. It is important that I have the opportunity to do this at this point in time on behalf of the Nigerian Bar Association. I must especially appreciate and celebrate our father, our mentor, our revered leader, our pathfinder, our Afe Babalola, 
CON and several titles to follow. Who is celebrating the 60th anniversary of his call to the bar? It is not a regular celebration. And with my very little years at the bar, I have not witnessed this kind of celebration. And I'm talking about the 60th anniversary being celebrated by any, not that people have not clocked 60 at the bar, but very, very few can stand tall in good health, graciously celebrating 60 at the bar. And with all grace that God has endowed him or her with. But Baba, Rafa Babola, is an exception. And this is indeed an auspicious occasion because we are all here as witnesses to what God has done in the life of our Baba. And that is why we must, as the Bar Association, join others to celebrate our Baba. I am here as the General Secretary of the Nigerian Bar Association, representing the Nigerian Bar Association, and of course, the President of the Nigerian Bar Association, who unfortunately is unavoidably absent today. On the 27th page of the brochure, the goodwill of the President of the Nigerian Bar Association is in the brochure. However, it is important that I read about two or three paragraphs, because I don't want to waste too much time, of what the President's message is to Baba Are Afe Babalola. Paragraph two of the message reads us. Are Afe Babalola is a man of many parts, a legal passion by excellence, a farmer, economist, philanthropist, educationist, a trailblazer, and so much more. The highly decorated legal icon, as in his 60 years at the bar, a worthy elder, illustrious, and exemplary member at that, contributed immensely to the development of our jurisprudence in various areas of law. Are has also shaped countless legal minds who passed through his law firm or crossed paths with him over the years, many of whom have risen to become judges, senior advocates of Nigeria, and very successful legal practitioners in public and private sectors. We all saw the very bright legal minds I filed out earlier representing the Emmanuel Chambers. Among them was a Minister of Justice, former Minister of Justice. A couple of them were at Honduras of various states. We had judges among them. This is what Emmanuel Chambers represents. And that is what Are Afe Babola represents. He has produced more than any firm in Nigeria, the highest number of senior advocates of Nigeria. I think we, we should do better than that. He deserves a better round of applause. He has also produced more than any firm in Nigeria, judges of various courts in Nigeria. And it is on this note, because of time that we do not have at our disposal, that I would like to also like to read the second to the last paragraph of the present goodwill. What is perhaps the most astounding of all the laudable achievements is the massive, deliberate, and conscious investment in all the sectors of our national life. As a farmer, Baba was the recipient of the 2014 African Man of the Year for Food Security Award. He is the highest private investor in the Kitty State. With the establishment of one of the fastest growing and top private investors on the African continent, 
most graduates are recognized and sought after across the world. Area Farms is believed in the future of this country and has permanently etched its name in gold. Area Favola is a name that we all are familiar with. But notwithstanding, it is important that I mention that I, by virtue of my opportunity to head what we called in IFE at that time, and I believe it's still in existence, equity chambers, met Baba first time in my life in 1997 as a student of Papua University. And since then, he has been a great mentor. Since then, I have followed his uh, you know, trajectory, trage uh, travesty and of course tra trajectories in the legal profession. And that is why, to the glory of God, when I was contested to become General Secretary, I visited Baba to tell him I was going to run for General Secretary. And Baba gave me assurance that I will not only win, but he will support my you know, election and so Unfortunately, I didn't go back for that support. But to the glory of God, Baba, thank you so much for the encouragement. And by the grace of God, by your encouragement, I'm now the General Secretary of Nigerian Bar Association. We are all here to celebrate you. We will continue to celebrate you. We thank God for his grace in your life. Thank God for his glory over your life. And by the grace of God, you will still be here to do more and do us proud more. Thank you very much. You can't go without announcing a donation. <laughs> by the, you know, by virtue of the fact that I am the General Secretary of Nigerian Power Station, and uh, I will announce a donation, but not in figure, that Nigerian Power Station will launch this book handsomely. And that information, once I consult with the President, we pass across to the organizer. Everything you said in your speech was about you as a person. So personally, what's your donation? As a, not just a son, a grandson of Baba, I will launch personally this book for the sum of 200,000 naira. Thank you so very much, sir. Dr. Anthony Idibe, SAN, 5 million naira. Alaji Lassun Sanusi, SAN, 2 million naira. Suma Food Nigeria Limited, 1 million naira. Oriola Mobolaji, a 2017 graduate of Abuad, 1 million naira. The Parents Teachers Consultative Forum of the University, 100,000 naira. Baba's younger brother, Pastor Modupe, Sister Taye, and Sister Funke, 2.5 million naira. Thank you. That, um, Ojoge, please, very quickly, your donation. Permit me to stand on the existing protocol. Uh, on behalf of myself and my firm, Ojoge Omelaye and Partners, I'll be donating the sum of 200,000 naira, and uh, for the College of Law, I'll be donating the sum of 1 million naira. Okay, come, 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 come. Very quick. Not you. My name is Mubolaji Oriola. I'm an Abad alumni, and in recognition of the efforts and the contribution of Aria Fabola to my life, I'll be donating a sum of 1 million naira to the university. Thank you so much, Baba. This your suit is very nice. Huh? Okay, anybody else? Right. Oh, madam. Yes, ma'am. I like that rainbow bag. Thank you, ma'am. You would help us speak for no longer than two minutes. Not even up to that. Okay, that's fine. Without protocol duly observe, observe, I would like to launch. My name is CJ Aremu SN, and I'd like to launch Baba's book with 250,000 naira. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much for that. Can you please uh, grab this off me? Any more persons here coming up? 
Are they wood? 500,000 Naira. Our students, please come, come, come. I'm impressed. Please come. Thank you. Thank you. Who is going to speak on your behalf? All protocols duly observed. After being inspired by our founders' quotes, on behalf of all the students, we would like to donate something towards our founders' book launch, and we'll be donating a sum of 20,000 Naira. Thank you. Come, what's your name? Come, come, come. Come and tell us your name so that we know who to hold because that 20,000 is very important. My name is Okikiolu Aokuobi. Okay, Okikiolua Okuobi. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for the students. Ma'am? The Vice Chancellor. MBBS 4. 400 level. That's my course of study. <laughs> yes, my people keep their word. MBBS people don't joke. Yeah? So MBBS, by the time we multiply it, you can see what's going to happen. So Baba, we want to thank you very much. You have been an inspiration. This is your day, and the time has come for you to speak to us. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest applause of today in celebration is my band on ready, on the ready. Lord has made, and you are witnesses to the events of today, to be part of history, recorded one, and the history to be written in the future. I stand on the existing protocol, but permit me to especially thank a number of people even though I'm thank everybody generally. I'm in particular great today, grateful to God, who has made it possible for me to traverse the universe. I've gone around the world. I knew what poverty was. I conquered poverty. And through God, I've invested in education because education is power. Without the power of education, I wouldn't be what I am today. When I studied privately and obtained the BS Economics of London University privately, I had the opportunity to serve in civil service. At that time, the white men were the permanent secretaries in Western region. He called me into his office. He said, the land that you passed the BS Economics of London University at home, at that time there was no economics in the university, the only university we had, which was the University of Baden. I said, yes. And I gave him my result. He said, congratulations. We are going to promote you 
to the position of senior assistant secretary, which at that time was equivalent to that of district officers, man usually by white men alone. The answer was, no, sir. Said why? I want to study law. The man looked at me. But to study privately for defense degree, yes. Want to start all over again, yes. Say good luck to you. But if you pass your LLB and build and come to the civil service for employment, we won't employ you again because you have been signed once. So don't worry, sir. I will never come back to the civil service. That's how I left. And uh, privately, I saw this for my law degree of Lauder University and with honors. Today, we have the representative of Lauder University here. Please stand up for recognition. <laughs> representatives of London University, stand up for recognition. Please give them a round of applause. That's not loud enough, please. Thank you for coming to Nigeria. Thank you for witnessing this event. Thank you for what you have done in my life. God bless you. Sit down. Um, I have with me here a man who made it possible for me to take interest in establishing a university. I was very, very successful in my law practice, working for the biggest oil companies in the country, making a lot of money, charging only dollars. I didn't charge Naira. So he invited me to come and become a, a minister. He called me to a corner, a special room. I told him, ha, ah, I don't want to leave my private practice. He persuaded me. I said, no, sir. But he loved me so much. He studied me so much that he now called on me and said, look, let me have one of your juniors to be the mini a minister. That was how I recommended Olujimi, who took just now, to become a minister. And the man who made that possible also asked me later to take over the position of the pro chancellor of the University of Lagos because there was corruption there. I agreed on condition that I would not collect the usual salary or allowances paid to pro chancellors. He said, that's your business. If you don't want to take money, good luck to you, but help us. I agreed. I was there for about seven years, and I brought in my clients, Bilos Bajar and so on, Todd Lewis, and put up my own structure, and so on and so forth. It was there I knew, with my eyes open, the problems we have in this country in education. It was there I knew. Why people who graduated from public universities were not employed by my clients? They share this and that. They prefer people who trained overseas. That man is here today. He was a man who, when he became president, saw that we are deep in debt. And he went around the world for two years, begging those we owed money. 
to forgive us or reduce the, amount, the, the debt. He succeeded, and Nigeria became a strong country financially. That man is here today, and I will ask him to please stand up for special recognition and thank you. President Obasanjo, please stand up. <laughs> President Obasanjo, stand up. Please stand up. Please stand up. Face the people. Face the people, not face me. Face them. Please give me a round of applause. Thank you. God bless. God bless you, sir. You can go back to your seat. Indeed, I thank everybody here. There's nobody who is not important. You're all important. I knew what we went through to get to this place. The roads are bad. I'm aware of it. There's no airport. I'm aware of it. But I have got in touch with the new governor of this state. And the new governor is here with me. Since I started this university, there is no governor that has sat with us throughout our ceremony. Please stand up for recognition, sir. <laughs> Thank you. You saw him when he said, I'm his father. You saw him when he said that he was a secretary carrying my bag when we were fighting for the state. Apparently, he too is not happy with the state of the economy of the of state. I have spoken to him and I want to divulge a secret. Please listen. I told him like I said when I wanted to start this university that an airport is necessary to develop any place. You go through Europe and North America and so on. You have planes from place to place because it's very safe. When I wanted to start this university, Governor Oni, I hope it's around. Are you here? Governor Oni is gone. Oh, thank God. Come out, come out. Stand there then. Give me a round of applause, please. Oh, I'm blessed for your coming to see the ceremony. It was a white woman, a West Indian, who came to me at Ibadu. She asked me to please build a special library for her in a village called Ayide, nine miles from Ibadu. And I did. Then she invited the governor of, it, of uh, your state and important people to the commissioning. As I said, the road is about nine miles on third. The community leader then asked me if I could be the university in that place for the library. And the community said they were going to give me land. The governor stood up and said, we will give you light, we will give you road, we will give you water. The following day, this newspaper in Nigeria carried the newspaper, the, the news. I felt that I invited to start at Ayedekpo next year. Ah. He's, he was governor of the state then. He saw the newspapers. He bought them, 
Run to Ibadan. Oga, you say yes. You want to build a university in Ibadan? I told him the facts. Even though he was governor, he prostrated. He said, sir, please be good to Abey Kiti. I said, will you be able to comply with the conditions given to me by, by the governor? Road, water, electricity. Of course, there was airport at uh, Badu. He said yes. He left. I didn't want to do it. Then he went to his Royal Highness, the way of Adoki, I think he's still there too, to appeal to him to beg me. They all came to Badu again. They repeated the same request. I said, I had, but I, I didn't consent. Then they went to my mother. And it was too much for me. I agreed to bring this university to this place because of this man and because of this. Man. <laughs> Not done. He went to President Jonathan, who was then the president of this country. And told him he needed an, an airport in Adekiti. The president agreed, but he said that he was going to create four airports one in his hometown, one in Adekiti, one in uh, Rivers, and one in the north. Ladies and gentlemen, all the other three are working today. What happened to the one? Promise to adequity. The president immediately released about 680 million to start the airport here. Unfortunately, he had an election petition filed against him by Dr. Fayemi, and the result came out. He lost. That one took over. That new governor now said, Airport is not my priority. And that's how we lost that chance. Please give me a round of applause for everything. Thank you. That is why up to today, you can go to your seat. We still do not have an airport. But in view of my new governor, who is here, and what I told him, Your Excellency, President Robert Sajor, you are listening to me. I've decided to support the government financially to ensure that the airport, which was uh, half done, will be operational within the next few months, by the grace of God. You have been here for a long time. I thank you very much. I have a speech that I'm not going to deliver any speech anymore. Except to say that uh, this country is not the same country when I studied law and when I came back and practiced law. The judiciary of which I, I met then is not the same judiciary. I therefore won't go through details, but I have some suggestions which I think uh, anybody would agree with me are necessary for today. First, I do not agree that uh, uh, the subject is imperative. The future of constitutional democracy in Nigeria is imperative of a new constitutional order. We do not a new constitutional order. No. It is true that people who make government are the people who run the government. But it's also true that you cannot have a constitution which can be run by even an agent when that constitution is for a country of nations. Nigeria is not one country. It's a country of 
more than 300 nations and tribes. You need a new constitution which will allow each part to develop at its own rate. And at the same time, a nation will now evolve from that constitution. If a Niger comes to this country today, he cannot run this country well because of the constitution we have. It allows certain to rule the country. It's not possible. So my own suggestion is that we need a new constitution immediately. And that constitution must be similar to the one which the leaders, in their own wisdom, after 10 years of deliberation in London, agreed to, which was a true federal constitution with regional bias. When Western Region had its own embassy in London, its own constitution, Eastern Region had its own constitution. There is a bus in London, the same thing in North. It was developing well. Western Region was doing very well. At, but for the military intervention, we were caught up with England today. As I said, we do not need a constitutional order, but a new constitution. And finally, I want to speak about my own profession, the judiciary. Our judiciary today needs a total overhaul. And you cannot do it without a, a new constitution. I have about three cases myself, fighting in respect of matters arising from the university. Do you know for the past four years, we've been, these cases have been on. We have some judges here. The High Court has not been able to sit for many months. Why? Because they are handling what they call election petitions. Election petitions will not be handled by sitting judges. They should be decided only by com people, uh, committee set up, consisting of senior advocates and retired judges. In that case, the regular court will not close down. That's my first observation. Second observation, of course, is uh, remuneration of judges. No senior advocate who is worth a thought, who is making money the way I did, who want to go and apply to become a judge. For what? What the judges in Nigeria and Spitians compared with others and overseas. There's urgent need under the new constitution to improve their salaries of judges. Thirdly, admission to law is important because it is the type of student who admit to the university that we train out and become lawyers. In many countries in the world, law, study of law is returned to only those who have obtained a degree in the liberal subject. My advice is that henceforth, under the new constitution, in the case of law degrees, nobody should be allowed to study law in any university unless he has a, a degree in a liberal subject. Then, in this country today, if you have a case in the Supreme Court, they last you eight years before you get judgment. High Court, even more. In the case of the Supreme Court, we should adopt what we were doing before. The Supreme Court used to go around the regions. And I will also suggest that the same thing should be done by the Supreme Court now. When they go around, every month they go around or whatever, 
they will clear all the backlog cases. But right now, litigants are totally dissatisfied with our, our court system. And this is one of the causes of poverty among lawyers now. Law profession is not one for beggars. It's not a profession for rich people. What attracted me to law was the fact that the lawyers at that time were the people who were riding the best cars, were most dignified people, and when you saw a lawyer, you would off your, your, your heart for him. I'm proud of law, but we need to do a lot of reform in our law system. Once more, let me tell you, we have food ready for you. And in the evening, by the grace of God, at about 7, 7.30, we will have on the bounce stand here the most illustrious, the most resourceful uh, singer and uh, player. I want to come and join us. We will dance to to uh, appreciate what God has done for me and for you. God bless you all. Safe journey back home. And before I leave, I hope uh, you appreciate me. Nigeria is big. It can be great. Don't lose hope. The cars will work for. Let me have music as well for. So we are, please be seated, if you may, please be seated. The 60th anniversary cake is going to be cut now. Please let me invite the following people to join our celebrant. The RA is there. Yeye RA Modukwe Babalola. Where is uh, uh, mommy? Please, she needs to join this. The AWI of uh, Adoikiti. Dr. Usman Abubakar Joss, His Excellency Biodun Abayomi Oyebanji, the Governor of Ikiti State, Mr. Shegwoni, former Governor of Ikiti State, Mr. Shegwoni, former Governor of Ikiti State, please come forward. And then, of course, the Vice Chancellor, Mrs. Maranda Olarinde. On the count of 60, one, 40, 55, 58, 59, 60.
For those of you who may not see, I hope the cameras are showing. Chief Obasanjo is cutting pieces of the cake now. To all around, he's the one serving them personally. He's taking a piece. Everybody is getting a piece of this cake. Chief Obasanjo is showing his culinary prowess as a good presidential chef this afternoon. He's doing a good job. Another piece comes out. The people now to his left are getting a piece. Dr. Usman Abubakar Joss, the Vice Chancellor, and many of the dignitaries there are getting a piece of this cake. Yes. So now. Ah, I get the biggest one. Thank you very much, Baba. Thank you very much, Baba. So this is my copy, my piece of the cake. Yeah. Please remember, whilst we're waiting for the vote of thanks to come, dinner this evening is 7.30, 8 o'clock later. And just in case, it will not be as loaded as this, because we're going to have... King Sonia Day on the dance band. King Sonia Day on the dance band. So we ask all of us, go back now, recharge, and come back. Yep. For the what? Eh. Okay. Please, come, Baba's children, please come and take a picture with him. Please, all the children, all the children with daddy. Very quickly, please, all the children, let's, why don't we stand behind the cake, please? Go around the cake now. All the, all the children, all the children. Hmm? So please remember. You can still support. Hold on, hold on, hold on, please. You can still support the book launch, please. I do look at government yeah, branch of Afe Barala beneficiaries. 25,000 Naira in support of the book. Can I please invite Mr. Adebayo Adenikbekun, S-A-N, please come to the microphone now to deliver the vote of thanks. Chief Adebayo Adenikbekun, S-A-N, the vote of thanks is yours to deliver. Remember, dinner at 7.30 this evening. Please come relax, ready to enjoy yourself this same venue, and kindly continue to support the launching of the book, 
The proceeds of that will go towards the establishment of the Abwat Museum. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Let's now listen to the vote of thanks. Thank you. Your Excellencies, the former President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Chief Olusha Egunobasanjo, GCFR, Your Excellency, the Executive Governor of Ekiti State, Governor Abiodu Oyebamiji, Your Excellency, the former Governor of Ekiti State, Chief Shegun Oni, My Lords, Your Royal Highness, Highnesses, Senior Advocates of Nigeria, learned colleagues, all our distinguished guests, on behalf of the organizing committee, I wish to thank you all for your contribution, your presence to the success of this event. Many people work tirelessly for the success of this program, time will fail me if I begin to mention them. Let me single out Baba's family, the university community, and many others. Thank you very much for your contributions. Finally, to our principal, Arafe Babalola, we thank you for the opportunity given us to organize this event. We wish you longer life and good health. Thank you all for coming. We wish you Johnny Masses back home. Thank you very much. And so, as we leave this afternoon, let us all remember, legacy is not what I did for myself. I know. It is what I'm doing for the next generation. And now we will take the Abwad anthem and then end with the Nigerian national anthem. So please, the Abwad anthem now. Abwad anthem. The Abwad Anthem. The National Anthem of the Federal Republic of Nigeria.
is Channel's television. You've been watching our live coverage of the Affair Babalola's Diamond Anniversary at the bar, marking 60, 60 years of being at the bar, live from Adoe Kiti in Ekiti State. We now return to Lagos to continue with our regular broadcast. Stay with us. television event. To Health Matters, authorities in South Africa are urging residents of the province of Hauteng to be vigilant about the liquids they consume as the death toll from a winter outbreak of cholera rises to nearly 50. Unions and community groups have demanded more government intervention to improve water quality. Most of the deaths over the last six 